Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. I feel like I'm paraphrasing the airlines industry when I say we know you have many choices and how you spend your time. And we're very grateful that you've chosen to join this workshop this morning and have prioritized this. Um, this workshop is really intended to be a community discussion about what can be done to accelerate innovation. As you know, the, the National Academy's report um, that was the work of the Committee on Identifying Innovation in Pharmaceutical Manufacturing, um, that report uh, stresses over and over again that even though the report was directed at recommendations for the FDA, it is really not going to be possible for the FDA to move the needle significantly on um, facilitating innovation in the pharmaceutical industry without the actions, um, uh, aligned actions of the entire stakeholder community. So this workshop is what can the entire stakeholder community accomplish together um, in order to accelerate innovation and bring um, beneficial technology forward in pharmaceutical manufacturing. So to that, um, given that the whole workshop is interactive and we really want to hear from the community, I'd like to point out that we are using Slido and the um, Slido code, um, I believe there, hopefully you already saw the QR code that you can scan. But if you go to slido.com, thank you, Linda, um, the QR code and the number for how to join that um, question platform is up. We encourage you, everyone in the community, to look at the ideas tab. The ideas tab has a field where you can enter themes for discussion. It's not word limited in the same way that the question and answer discussion is. Um, so in the ideas tab, um, where there's no uh, complete anonymity, right? You can use your first and last name initial for posting. Um, but if you, there is a theme that you would like to have the community discuss, um, we encourage you to put it in the ideas tab and then others can uh, weigh in on um, the priority for discussing that theme. And of course, um, it goes without saying really, but I'll say it anyway, that you need to be respectful in your language and tolerant towards all viewpoints in this um, interaction mode. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to give a little bit of a recap for um, what oh, Linda has. All right, so Linda's given us um, instructions in the chat uh, for using the Slido as well. So with that, I'd, I'd like to talk about yesterday and some of the highlights from yesterday. Um, the workshop has been structured so that really the first two sessions were on information gathering. So the first session on information gathering was about the technologies that the committee identified and um, th that are likely to appear on the horizon in the first five to 10 years, and whether or not the committee correctly identified um, those areas where innovation is most likely to, to appear in pharmaceutical manufacturing before the FDA. And um, then also really did the COVID pandemic accelerate the timeline for any of that innovation, right? So we heard from uh, several speakers, uh, Narendra Bam, uh, about what innovation is already happening within their companies and what the status is of whether that would be implemented. I think in general, the speakers were uh, agreed that the innovation that the committee identified um, was, was pretty much a, a good set, right? That there weren't any obvious gaps in, the, in what the committee identified. And so we appreciate that, that feedback. Um, then in session two, we focused on what existing mechanisms are out there in the stakeholder community that facilitate innovation. We heard from the FDA on the mechanisms that they use for innovation, primarily the Emerging Technologies Program and what their plans are for um, expansion and sort of the, the next version of the Emerging Technologies Program. Um, our speakers, and Sarah Arden did a great job talking about um, the different mechanisms that um, are accessible to industry and, and how um, the companies or, or the perspective of industry in using 
um, those mechanisms, such as the you know, guidance from industry, the one-on-one -on -one sponsored communications, or guidance from the FDA, excuse me, one-on-one um, -on -one sponsored communications, but then external partnerships and other means of, sort of more actively pursuing innovation. Um, and then in the session three, we discussed where the gaps are in those existing mechanisms. And it would be interesting, um, you know, when the community talks about those gaps, it's very clear that industry is pursuing innovation. And it's very clear that the FDA is acting to you know, facilitate innovation through mechanisms. And so really the question is, where are opportunities to either better align um, incentives so that the business drivers within industry to pursue innovation are better aligned, um, or I guess the value is understood um, as well as the risk of innovating. And then how the FDA um, regulatory, global regulatory really, community um, can help align those incentives so that the risks are lessened when the benefit to the quality or the costs or um, you know, just the consistency and reliability of the supply chain um, you know, provides a benefit. Um, so really what can be done to get the risk benefit equation um, from an industry perspective in favor of the benefit and, and lessening the risk. Um, so I think the work of today is really to take that further, right? A lot of input um, from our speakers yesterday, um, some interesting questions for discussion, some interesting suggestions on what the community could do. Um, one theme that came up over and over again um, through different speakers and also through the community was this idea of um, having a group approach regulators with a technology in, in the pre-competitive early stages and talk about risk and benefits there. And obviously the, 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 what you lose by that approach is specificity because it's not connected with the ultimate drug product at the end. Um, but it perhaps gains in a shared understanding, a shared knowledge of how that technology might be um, appropriately applied in pharmaceutical manufacturing. So with that um, sort of lengthy recap of where we, how, where we started yesterday, where we are now, I'd like to um, introduce Sally. Oh, oh, first I need to go back, sorry. I'm so glad Linda gave me good notes. Um, I'd like to call up the Slido questions very quickly and just level set us about what the, the community thought. So Eric, if you could pull up uh, the Slido uh, polling questions, um, I believe if you could go back to question number four, is that possible? And I encourage the community, if you did not vote, uh, I believe the poll is still open right here. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so the first question was, um, well, a relevant question, which of these innovations do you believe will have the greatest opportunity to advance pharmaceutical manufacturing? And there was quite a bit of support for process intensification and also modeling and digital designs, but obviously continuous manufacturing. Um, modular systems, I suspect, and um, is lower on the list just because it's, it's probably a part of that process intensification and continuous manufacturing. Um, and again, with the advanced process control and automation. Um, but it, it's interesting to see that all of these are viewed as, um, as important, but perhaps there are um, areas where specific uh, companies or innovators um, have different interests. Um, Linda's giving me guidance to pause a minute and allow those joining today to, to add their votes um, to this. So I'll give you that minute. It looks like nothing's changing right now. So if we can advance to question number five. Thank you. Um, so the next few questions were really, to what extent do you think it's possible to accelerate innovation in pharmaceutical manufacturing 
either by the actions um, that are really more within the regulatory sphere. And um, as you see, the community believes that there is, you know, to some extent, it is possible that innovation could be accelerated by changes in regulatory policy, procedures, practices, or cultures. Um, but it's interesting with the option of to a large extent, um, so 65% of the population of the community didn't think that that is the largest contribution, right? Um, you know, so to some extent that is true, um, according to the community. Right, so it looks like that's stabilized. So if we could go on to question number six, thanks. Which type of regulatory changes do you believe can best enable innovation? Right, um, it's interesting that workforce training um, currently seems to be um, more significant uh, slightly. Well, I guess we, we don't know what the arrow bar is, but, um, oh, okay, so that's moving as we speak. Guidance and regulations and workforce training. Um, really, it looks like a, a pretty decent split on all of the above. If we can move to question number seven. Okay. And this was interesting. Um, it would be based on the attendees, the participants in the workshop um, and the large number of industry members, it would appear that the community believes that industry practices are really a significant opportunity to enable innovation. And so to a large extent, um, the culture of, in, or the, the ability to enable pharmaceutical innovation right, is in the hands of industry practices. And the next question, please. Okay. All right, so which industry practices would be most impactful to enable innovation? Increased recognition of manufacturing as a value driver and a greater accept willingness to accept risk. Um, really all of these um, are viewed as important. So, I think um, the poll is still open. I encourage you to be using the Slido platform. I got a side message from someone that says that the ideas tab um, doesn't appear to be working yet. So I don't know if that's just because the polling questions are up, um, but. It's, uh, uh, it's because the polling questions are up and we wanted to review it with everyone. But once uh, the session starts after Sally, I'll turn it on for okay. ideas tab. All right, great. Thank you, Linda. Um, so it sounds like um, once we move to Sally, so I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce Sally so that you can begin putting your ideas in the Slido. So Sally Romero-Torres will be moderating session four, and session four is on possible solutions and actions. And I'll turn it over to Sally to, um, to lead us into that. Thanks, Sally. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Thank you, Kelly. Can you guys hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so um, today, you know, after all those great presentations that we had yesterday, um, and you know, where everybody was providing their point of view. We also gave um, some opportunities to the FDA to provide, you know, to answer to certain questions that were in the report. Um, we want to talk in session four about possible solutions and actions, right? To some of those um, gaps or opportunities that we have identified. Um, so the format of this session, it will be first a talk by the FDA that will be followed by a series of short talks. It's gonna be three short talks that we're gonna be having. And after those three short talks, we're gonna have a community discussion, which hopefully is gonna be very alive and everybody's gonna be trying to fight just to um, ask questions and, and to ex express their point of view. Uh, so the first talk, it's gonna be, as I mentioned by the folks from the FDA, it's gonna be done by uh, Mr. Adam Fisher and Thomas O'Connor. Um, and uh, Adam Fisher is an Associate Director of Communications at the FDA, at the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Um, and he's also a chemist at the FDA. 
and, and Dr. Co Thomas O'Connor um, is, is the director of the Division of Product Quality Research Office of Testing Research, Office of Pharmaceutical Quality for CEDAR at the Food and Drug Administration. Dr. O'Connor is the director of the Division of Product Quality Research in the Office of Testing Research and Office um, of Pharmaceutical Quality, and is a member of CEDAR's Emerging Technology Team, ETT. His responsibilities include managing research and testing projects that answer and anticipate pharmaceutical quality related regulatory challenges through scientific approaches. The impact of the OTR research and testing is utilized to support regulatory assessments and policy development in areas such as advanced manufacturing, drug quality standards, characterization of complex drug substances and drug products and post-market um, product quality and public health issues. Tom is a co-author of several papers on emerging pharmaceutical technologies, such as continuous manufacturing, 3D printing, and the utilization of modeling and simulation for quality assurance. Through the ETT, he has contributed to review of several regulatory applications utilizing novel technologies. He is the co-chair of the OPQ Manufacturing Science and Innovation Center of Excellence, and is a member of the Advanced Manufacturing Working Groups within the FDA. Tom originally um, joined the FDA as a chemistry reviewer in the Office of Generic Drugs. And prior to joining the FDA, Tom worked at ExxonMobil Research and Engineering, where he held job functions in both process analytical technologies and process control. Dr. O'Connor earned his bachelor degrees in chemical engineering from the Cooper Union and a PhD in chemical engineering from Princeton University. So with that, I would like to um, welcome um, Thomas O'Connor and Adam Fisher. Thank you, Sally, so much for the intro. I am Adam Fisher. I'm the Associate Director of Science and Outreach in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality at CEDAR. I do wanna take some time here today to describe some of the actions we're taking to address gaps and pain points in the current regulatory framework. And I also wanna start with an apology to whoever is advancing the slides here today, because I do have a number of animated bullet points that we'll need to pop up. So I will be calling out the clicks as we go. Hopefully things don't get off track. Uh, next slide, please. So you've already heard about our emerging technology program earlier here in the workshop. A big milestone it was the 100th industry sponsored meeting. One thing that I do want to reiterate that Larry Lee mentioned yesterday is that you do not have to have a pending application to be part of the emerging technology program. You can be part of that program earlier in the technology development. Uh, next clip, please. So because of that program and because of workshops like this, we know that there is a rapid emergence of advanced manufacturing technologies click please. And we have efforts in advanced manufacturing to really drive toward this long held cedar vision of having a maximally efficient, agile, flexible pharmaceutical manufacturing sector that reliably produces high quality drugs. And that said, we recognize that the emergence of these technologies means that the regulatory landscape needs to evolve along with them. Click please. So we are reviewing the regulatory landscape and then we're working to ensure its readiness to accommodate the new technologies that we'll see over the next five to 10 years. Next slide, please. So we're calling this initiative the framework for advanced, sorry, framework for regulatory advanced manufacturing evaluation or frame. Um, Dr. Kopcha mentioned it yesterday and I will talk about it in more detail here today. We need a regulatory framework that provides certainty for stakeholders and is flexible enough to handle the technologies that we might see over this time frame that I mentioned of the next five to 10 years. Next slide, please. We thought it was important that as an agency, we understand innovations in pharmaceutical manufacturing a bit better. Click please. So these workshops and the resulting report have allowed us to get a much better sense of what these emerging technologies look like, how they're going to be applied in pharma, and then most importantly, their impact on public health. And click please. We've also shared this vision in a paper on Industry 4.0 that Dr. Kopcha mentioned yesterday. I point out that this was uh, authored primarily by Sarah Arden when 
she was still a member of the agency not that long ago. And of course, Sarah gave a, gave a great presentation yesterday on some of the tools that are out there to stimulate and support innovation. And I would just add that from my perspective, I think COVID-19 accelerated the need for manufacturing innovations and especially ones that are more responsive to rapidly changing demand and technologies that reduce our dependence on human interventions in the process. Next slide, please. So because of our engagements through the Emerging Technology Program and because of these workshops, we've now identified four technologies that we believe will play a major role over the next five to 10 years. Click please. The first is end-to-end -end continuous manufacturing, or we call it ECM. Click please. The next is distributed manufacturing, or DM. Click please. The next is point of care manufacturing, or POC. Click please. And then the final one is artificial intelligence, which everyone knows is AI. Now I wanna explain a little bit more about how we are defining these technologies. Next slide, please. Uh, click please. So end-to-end -end CM uh, is a fully integrated process in which raw materials or chemical intermediates are continuously fed in and then finished drug products are continuously removed. Uh, I think most are familiar with some form of continuous manufacturing to this point, um, which has been looking primarily at manufacturing drug products or drug substance, whereas end-to-end -end is the whole thing in one process. Click please. DM is a decentralized mobile manufacturing platform that can be deployed to multiple locations and importantly, within one quality management system. Click please. POC is actually a subset of DM that operates in close proximity to patient care. And this could include places such as hospitals, nursing home, physician's offices and the like. Click please. And then finally there's AI, uh, which can perceive the environment through data acquisition, interpret the data and decide the best actions. Next slide, please. And so here's a very important thing to consider as we look at the framework None of these technologies exist in a vacuum. There are many advanced technologies that could be deployed together. And for the four that we are focusing on, that's certainly the case. So for example, some DM will employ CM and some DM will be designed to operate in a CGMP environment and be POC. And for example, I would even note that you could have something in the middle bottom of this slide that uses end-to-end -end continuous distributed point of care manufacturing controlled by artificial intelligence. And this is not science fiction anymore. This, this is something that will be happening. Next slide, please. So with this all in mind, we want to ensure that we're taking a systematic approach to developing a regulatory framework. And we've divided our effort into three phases. The first is building the foundation. The second is planning the implementation. And the third is setting things in motion. And we are now at the point where we are transitioning into phase three. Next slide, please. We call phase one building the foundation. And this is where, based on our knowledge of relevant authorities, we brought all of the relevant OPQ experts together to assess the existing guidance, regulations, and statutory authorities to identify any gaps or pain points. So let me just pause for a second and define what I mean by gaps and pain points. So gaps refer to the provisions, regulations, or guidance that govern quality assessment or inspection that preclude approval of an application proposing to use an advanced manufacturing technology. Pain points are all the other regulatory challenges. For example, this might be ambiguous language or lack of guidance on a specific to topic or just general um, lack of technical knowledge on a certain subject. So, let me give you some examples of things that we might consider gaps and pain points. Next slide, please. So one might be the applicability of a regulatory terminology that does not or may not account for emerging technologies. The second is potential holes in drug application requirements. And then finally, the ability of these technologies to comply with current regulations and standards. And now we need a framework to address these gaps and pain points. Next slide, please. So phase two of our effort focused on making recommendations to address these gaps and pain points and also planning for the long-term implementation of the framework. 
So during this period, we conducted an in-depth impact analysis to inform all of our potential recommendations. And what I mean by that is instead of just looking at the gaps and pain points for new technologies, the impact analysis looked in two directions. That is, it also looked how potential changes to the framework could impact existing technologies, because clearly we don't want any unintended consequences from something that we're trying to do here. And this view enabled us to come up with a series of preliminary recommendations for the framework. Next slide, please. So phase three, this is where we are now, and this is going to be a multi-year effort that we be begin by explaining what we're doing and also asking for help, right? So first, we're increasing our public outreach to share information and provide visibility into what we're doing. Um, I hope it's obvious that that's what I'm doing right now uh, as I speak. Uh, second, we are going to gather input from the public on the gaps and pain points that we've identified to further inform our thinking. And once we've had an opportunity to understand the issues and leverage our science and policy experts, we'll begin implementing different components of the regulatory framework. And now the crux of our outreach will be public white papers that will share the regulatory gaps and pain points we've identified that are going to be released for public comment. And so you can expect to see white papers on these gaps and pain points in the not too distant future. And we plan to take the public comments and then post final versions of these white papers after we've taken all input into account. And these white papers and the associated recommendations that come from them to address the gaps and pain points will inform an overall internal CEDAR frame roadmap that will be the thing that we follow to make sure that we realize this vision. Now, keep in mind that everything we do, including related to the framework, is built on a foundation of science. And so now I'm gonna pass this over to my colleague, Tom O'Connor, to explain how we've built a scientific foundation to support advanced manufacturing. Tom. Tom, I think we're having some issues hearing you. Um, Tom, we're, we're having some issues with, uh, I think, your mic. I think in the meantime, you might need to advance one, one slide further. Thank you. Hi, Tom. You might try at the bottom left of Zoom, making sure the correct microphone is selected. Uh, we noticed there wasn't any audio coming through at all, so it might be a, a microphone issue. Um, but in Zoom on the bottom left next to your mute button, there's an up arrow, uh, and then there'll be a list of microphones that are connected to your computer. So they may, may, the wrong one may be selected. So maybe while Tom's trying to get online, I, I can just give a, a brief introduction to the, the science and research element of uh, OPQ's and CEDAR's actions here. And so I think it's important not to forget that the, the R in CEDAR stands for research, right? And as I mentioned, science and research really forms the, the foundation of everything that we do as an agency. Um, could you click on the slide, please? Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID. Hey, 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 Tom, we could hear you through your microphone. We just heard you dialing in, so your microphone may be active. If you want to try unmuting and trying again. Church nine, nine. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> all right. Thanks, Adam. I literally had to put you on the spot there. <laughs> but, all right. Over to you, Tom. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, thank you. Sorry, apologize for technical. I'm not sure what happened, but 
Um, yeah, yesterday, you know, there was a comment about what we mean by, you know, science and risk-based and, um, you know, OPQ is all, always valued and CEDAR, right, the, the R and CEDAR, the importance of science. And that means we actually have dedicated staff, laboratories and facilities to really support that. And that science really enhances the FDA's capacity for decision-making. In uh, OPQ, you know, that's focused on drug quality. Uh, next uh, bullet, please. And we're talking about, you know, Adam's, you know, slides, thinking about frame. Another thing where our science is very important is helping us to modernize regulatory pathways when there's emerging technologies. And that could be new drugs, um, in this case, new ways to make products, but that's also very important. We also use our science to address regulatory and scientific issues that are mission critical. So those are the issues that we're facing you know, as of today. Uh, next bullet. But then there's also the forward-looking, anticipating to make sure that we're ready to address the issues of tomorrow. And that's uh, kind of part of what we're doing now. And that's come into play during the pandemic, came into play during you know, uh, the current issues with nitrosamines, heparin before that. You know, we've always been have that capacity to use these science to help us address these public health um, events. And, um, and now we're kind of turning that to, to advanced manufacturing. Uh, next slide. So we've, we've been actually spending the last, uh, when ETT stood up around 2014, 2015, we realized that we needed a new component to our science program that would support the applications we were kind of expecting to see in the future that uh, we were starting to get engagement with industry. Um, so at that time, we, we started up some manufacturing science uh, research programs. Then a couple of years ago, we got a more directed uh, funding and allocation of resources to support that program. As part of that, we developed a series of research plans uh, that are now active in, in several different areas. That helped build us a cap capacity in things like novel manufacturing methods, so like continuous manufacturing, 3D printing, things like precision analytics, uh, high resolution mass spectrometry is an example. We feel like this is really important to help us, especially when thinking about advanced manufacturing for complex products. You know, the analytics is an important piece there. Um, things like PAT, and not just sensors, but also advanced process control, uh, modeling and simulation, and also emerging therapies, like things like oligonucleotides. And so as we look at the per project portfolio, just to give you some sense of what uh, we're currently working on, we kind of group projects into these different areas based on the research plan. So we have a group of projects around novel manufacturing methods. This is mostly small molecule focused. Again, we have another uh, large active project in precision analytics. Um, and then we have series of projects that are around uh, the biomanufacturing space and advanced manufacturing for biopharmaceuticals, some for emerging therapies. And kind of cross-cutting, we have a series of process modeling and I would say AI machine learning uh, projects. Um, and we've, part of the developing this capability, we've actually stood up a computational lab that will kind of, that complements our ex experimental laboratory facilities. Uh, next uh, bullet here. And just in the last few years, as we stood up these research plans, these, these projects produced over uh, 65 internal reports and publications. And these internal reports are, are things that are going directly to review teams or uh, uh, to support a project, support a sponsor meeting. So they're very impactful uh, outputs. Next slide. We realized that this is, talked a little bit about what we're doing internally, but we realized that this is really a community effort. And we realized we uh, couldn't make the advances we wanted to in our science program without collaborating with outside experts. Uh, and because of that, we stood up a number of different uh, opportunities. We leveraged the FDA's regulatory science broad agency announcement, as well as OPQ initiated some uh, focused grant opportunities so that we could really leverage the expertise uh, in the academic and, and some uh, in industry uh, companies. And over this, these are projects that really represent, again, this last few years where we've had uh, you know, some dedicated resources to support these, this program. And I just wanted to kind of group them into kind of some of the themes. And again, you'll see common things around smart manufacturing, uh, again, some novel uh, manufacturing methods, uh, PET, uh, group on process modeling simulation, and also one on training. The training is another big component uh, of what we're trying to accomplish through the science program. Uh, 
next uh, bullet here. And then this is an accounting that was done in the spring. You know, these projects again are, are just a couple years old. Some of them are just started, um, and and they'll produce more and more reports and to advance the the scientific the body of scientific knowledge around these. Um, technologies that we can then apply to help uh, support our decision making. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, first bullet, please. Yeah, so what have we actually accomplished or learned from these programs? So the research programs have actually directly supported ETT feedback and application assessment for over 10 projects. I think Larry, you saw Larry mentioned yesterday, we have like 12 application approvals for that program. So the research is directly supporting a, a heavy percentage of those, you know, greater than 80% or so. And those projects are directly being supported by the, the research, which means that either we're doing a study to support that review or the SME from that research is, is being added to that review team to address certain uh, application issues. Next, uh, policy and guidance development. Uh, so informing the Q13 is, a, is an example. You know, the FDA's draft guidance and our experience say 2019 was very focused on small molecule solid drug products. That's what that guidance was focused on. But ICHQ-13 has a bigger scope, it includes drug substances, includes large molecules. Um, and we've had a lot of engagement with the ETT in kind of the pre, pre application space and actually have a couple of approvals in some of those areas now. But the research program, you know, complemented that, provided a lot of knowledge to support, you know, expanding the scope of, of what uh, we could publish harmonize as a guidance. Um, and of course, supporting frame, you know, I think it underfines uh, a lot of the decisions and a lot of the thinking that went on you know, during phase one and phase two, and, and we'll certainly support it going forward in phase three. Next uh, bullet, please. And workforce development. I think Mike, you know, highlighted one of the accomplishments, recent accomplishments from the ETT was graduating the continuous direct compression from an ETT, you know, focused thing to moving it to more of the regulatory, uh, regular review channels I think, or assessment channels, I would say, processes. So in order to do that, we had to train the staff that was going to take on these, these new applications. And we did that through a collaboration. So, you know, part of that was we funded uh, ex external partners, external experts to develop some training material, training classes that provided the technical knowledge. And we complemented that with our internal training, where the lab and these partners with the assessment offices develop case studies and hands-on training that would more directly apply to how you apply this knowledge to do what we, you know, the day-to-day -day tasks of an investigator or assessor. And that helped, you know, make this accomplishment, you know, happen as far as graduating the CDC. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And where are we going from here? I think it's a really exciting development. You know, we, we are currently constructing a, a research manufacturing pilot plant that will be located very close to the White Oak FDA campus. Uh, it's currently under construction, you know, uh, 2022. Hopefully this, this facility will, will go live. And this is really gonna increase our capacity to generate knowledge and train FDA staff. So when I think about this new facility, it's designed to be modular and flexible, really focusing, I, I'd say, on integration. Integration can mean equipment, can mean actually analytics and manufacturing, as well as automation, thinking about uh, integrating the, all the modeling the efforts that we've uh, invested in, integrating that with the actual processes, and training. Training is going to be a big, big focus here. This facility has dedicated training uh, resources, facilities to really support that workforce development. Next uh, slide. And we're going to continue to make investment in the research programs where we need it, in the, in the kind of growing areas of advanced manufacturing. Uh, we've awarded five new uh, collaborative projects uh, just in September. Again, focusing, I, I would say, if I looked at the projects that are funded, you're thinking about uh, kind of industry 4.0 themes there, as well supporting some of the social science and uh, data science around uh, facility assessment, uh, quality management of maturity. Uh, those, those are big programs that Mike mentioned yesterday, and, and we're kind of funding some projects to advance some of the, the thinking around that too. Uh, next bullet. And continue in alignment with the, the emerging technology program and frame. You know, our research, Product development science is really mission uh, driven. We really need to support the decision making at the FDA. Uh, so we want to make sure we're close alignment with those two programs and support them the best way uh, we can. Uh, so just some closing uh, thoughts. You know, I think there was a comment about you know strengthening the Cedars expertise in innovative technologies, and we really think uh, our science program is one way we do that we, through developing SMEs as well as through training. Next uh, bullet. 
we realize it's something we can't do alone. We, we really want to uh, leverage and collaborate to advance the science. Uh, so we do that through external collaborations, uh, but I think maybe there's other opportunities. We're really excited about our new infrastructure coming online. I think this is really going to help grow the program, increase the impact we're able to deliver uh, for OPQ and agency and the community at large. Um, and then next slide. And again, just focusing, you know, if we're going to continue to make sure our, our programs are, are focused on uh, the mission at, at the FDA um, and, and supporting this and hopefully making the change, right? Helping do our part um, to help drive this. Uh, so with that, I conclude our, our talk and uh, we look forward to the discussion later. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for, for this great presentation and, and for your great leadership. It's definitely exciting times at the FDA, so we are all looking forward to see what's a product of all these investments. Um, I would like just to put a little bit of like a like a like a grain of um, sand, right, in, in people's minds right now, just to keep on um, cementing the ideas. Is that, in my opinion, like this is especially needed right now because from two thousand nine to two thousand nineteen, we have so. Um, a doubling in specialty drugs and specialty drugs require more advanced controls and, and a more advanced control strategy. So um, just we should keep in mind that whenever we are talking about the need and the business need for um, advanced technologies. Um, so with that, let's move now to the series of short talks that we're going to be having. And then for this session, we'll have um, Kevin Lee who is the Institute Director of Nimble. We'll have uh, Fernando Muzio, who's a distinguished professor at Rutgers um, School of Engineering. And we will have um, Gillian Sanders, Schmilder, and Stephen Culver from the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. Um, let's start by introducing Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee is the Gore Professor of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Delaware. He currently serves as the director of the National Institute of Innovation in Manufacturing Biopharmaceuticals. And he previously served as the director of the Delaware Biotechnology Institute. Dr. Lee received his bachelor degree in chemical engineering from Princeton University and both his master's and his PhD in chemical engineering from Caltech. He also completed a postdoc in Caltech's biology division and spent several years at the Biotechnology Institute at the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. Previously, he was um, one on the faculty at Cornell University where he held the titles of Samuel C. and Nancy M. Fleming, chair professor, professor in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering, director of the Cornell Institute of Biotechnology and director of the New York State Center for Life Science Enterprises. He's also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and of the American Institute for Medical and Bi Biological Engineering. His research expertise in systems and synthetic biology applied to biopharmaceutical manufacturing as well as in the diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. So thank you, Dr. Lee, and the podium is yours. Great, thank, thank you very much. And I certainly wanna thank the um, workshop organizers for the opportunity to address all of you. Um, uh, just uh, as a small disclosure at the bottom, I, and I think it was referenced, um, I, I do help lead Nimble and, and that is uh, sponsored by NIST. And, and I also want to, in that context, reflect that my, my perspective that I'll share really comes more on the bio side of things uh, for the larger molecules. Um, I have a little less uh, expertise and visibility understanding in the context of small, some of the smaller molecules. Um, what I'm going to do on the next slide is um, kind of reiterate a little bit some of the points that I heard yesterday that resonated with um, my perspective and then use that as a chance to make some perhaps bold uh, suggestions and proposals um, the goal that we were given uh, in this session for all the speakers is to stimulate discussion on where the community might go from here. So the, the first kind of point here in red is that while I think there's a lot of different stakeholders in our ecosystem broadly, and each stakeholder has different perspectives, there really is a common purpose across the entire ecosystem. Uh, whether you work in the regulated industry, whether you uh, work for the agency or whether you work for other organizations. 
And in my words, it's some version of ensuring patient access to a supply of medicines to enhance our health and well being. And you could put in the qualifiers of safe, efficacious, reliable, and so on, but it's really about um, patient well being. And so that, that slice of apple pie is meant to recognize that I, I think we're all on the same team. Um, so on the next slide, um, the, the evidence for that, uh, and I did not cherry pick these, I, I literally just went to Google and pulled up five companies that came to mind and, and Googled what their mission statements were and took it from their website. So the Pfizer one, of course, talks about making the world a healthier place at, at markets to improve the health and wellness of people. Uh, Amgen is striving to serve patients um, by delivering therapies that restore health or save lives. BMS is to deliver innovative medicines that help patients, GSK preventing and treating disease and keeping people well. So, you know, I, I think many of the companies are well aligned at, at a high level about what their goal is and their mission is. On the next slide, I, I took some language um, from vendors and suppliers. Uh, again, just uh, pulled from Sartorius and Millipor Sigma. They also reference in their mission, uh, enabling the development of new and better therapies, more affordable medicines, improving health and life worldwide. So I, I think it's fair to say that from the industry side, whether you're directly in the regulated industry or work with closely with the regulated industry, um, there is broad alignment on what we want to achieve together. And the next slide uh, is some text that I pulled from the FDA website. So at a high level, the FDA's self-stated mission at the top is to ensure safety, efficacy, and security of, of drugs, biological products, and medical devices. And, and something that, frankly, I had not actually taken the time to study before two nights ago was the statement that the FDA self-declared is responsible for advancing the public health by helping to speed innovations that make medical products more effective, safer, and more affordable. Now that's the FDA uh, mission. Uh, Center for Drugs, of course, has um, their own mission, which is around ensuring safe and effective drugs that are available uh, to improve the health of people. So again, I'm just trying to recap at a high level that I think we all come at wanting to solve at, at some basic level, the same kind of problem. So the next slide, then uh, I wanna take us to thinking about what the current situation is. And uh, advanced manufacturing, which I, I put in quotes here, uh, because I think uh, we, we just heard a great presentation from Adam about uh, a framework for thinking about advanced manufacturing at the agency. Um, but I think there's still a diversity of thought on what constitutes advanced manufacturing. But I would argue advanced manufacturing approaches are typically not limited by the technology itself. I think the, uh, the risk is a, a business risk around adoption of those technologies. And, and it's a perhaps a, a broad overgeneralization, but I think a lot of the technologies that we hear about are uh, things that can work. The science is there, the technology maybe needs to be matured, but it works. But the reason we don't see it adopted as rapidly as one might hope is because of business risk around adoption. And that really, that business risk is tied to speed to market being critically important to companies so that adoption of a new technology or a manufacturing technology um, is gonna increase the risk associated with getting that medicine uh, to market. And, and so one could argue that there is very little or in some cases, perhaps no business incentive for new technologies to be implemented um, in the manufacturing of these medicines in today's uh, climate or today's situation. And the fact that we have a very fragmented global regulatory environment raises the bar even higher. Now, there's been a lot written and discussed yesterday and um, on you know, the business risks and why we have that situation, but I think that's the reality. So on the one hand, I think we can think about what the agency can do to help encourage and position itself to be ready to respond to new technologies. And I think it sounds like they're making incredible investments and, and have put a primary emphasis on that. But at the same time, I think there's a, a real problem here that the, the business side also needs uh, to find ways to be incentivized. And I think some of the poll results kind of captured that. Um, the FDA definition um, of advanced manufacturing that I pulled from their website uh, is, uh, it's a collective term for 
uh, medical product manufacturing technologies that improve drug quality, address shortages, and speed time to market. So you would think that uh, things should be aligned from that perspective. So what do we need and where do we go? Uh, the next slide uh, um, talks a little bit about um, the FDA's perspective on advancing health. And what I think, uh, in my anecdotal experience, is are some examples of things that are working well, and then some of the challenges. So I think some of the things that are working well, I think there's a lot of really positive messaging coming from the podium and from the leadership and thought leaders at the agency around this. I think there's a real genuine willingness to partner, and I think we've heard now a number of examples of that uh, this morning as well as yesterday. Uh, I think those are all real positive messages. I think the agency has uh, been engaging with public-private partnerships to advance their understanding and build relationships. Uh, we've seen that in Nimble through their participation in active listening sessions with us, participation on projects to advance scientific research, and we just heard uh, Tom O'Connor talk about uh, some of uh, the exciting things they're working on in that space. Uh, they've established, I know, Kratis with uh, a number of organizations. I think access uh, through the ETP going through the ETT, I think, uh, has been very generally well received, and the data supports that. And I think the opportunities to engage in consortia approaching the ETT, whether through shared test beds and so on, is, is a highlight that I, I want to echo um, uh, in my time here. I think there's a number of challenges, though, that also emerge. I, I think there's a willingness to partner, but I would argue there's a, a lack of resources and bandwidth to engage at the level that uh, would really have the kind of uh, impact that we all want to achieve. I think uh, attorneys at various organizations would uh, agree that while the, the science and the programmatic people want to engage, um, it's not always the easiest uh, thing to engage with, with the agency or, or frankly, in some cases, the federal government generally. Um, those, I think, are solvable problems. And while there are a number of mechanisms in place uh, to uh, engage with the community, advance uh, the interests and in advanced manufacturing, that experience with some of those mechanisms uh, sometimes falls short, whether it's application reviews where the messaging from the podium is not well aligned with some of the questions and, and uh, that people get back in the industry or responses to reviews on BAA applications, et cetera. I think uh, as with any large organization, sometimes uh, there's opportunities to improve. And, uh, and our current system is one where I would uh, posit, and it's a bit of a forward uh, pushy statement, that reviewers may actually be dissuaded uh, from supporting innovations, particularly innovations that they're not uh, familiar with when they see them in applications, because the reviewer has everything to lose uh, by pushing and allowing a technology to move forward. And, and so that, that's not an ideal situation. So what, what can we think about doing on the next slide? Um, I think uh, we need community-wide action. Uh, I think organizations and individuals have to actively engage in a sustained effort to help realize the change that we all seek. I think it's not good enough to say there are hurdles to innovation and talk about the hurdles. We have to go and attack and do something to try to clear those hurdles. I think the agency has indicated uh, through some of their work that they're trying to get ahead of that and do some of the things that need to be done, but we all need to be partners for change. I think our industry matters to a lot of us <laughs> and to all of us, and our access to advanced manufacturing capability matters. And I think US leadership and competitive matters. And so the opportunity is there uh, to address everybody's mission uh, to bring these medicines to patients. And what's really frustrating is it's not even the technology in many cases, it, it's something beyond the technology. Okay, so here's some nuggets of some ideas um, that I, I put as on the next slide as um, policy opportunities. So they're not necessarily things that people in the agency could necessarily do themselves. Um, and I realize when I put up policy ideas, I, I limit the ability of federal employees to, to comment too much, but they're not active policies per se. So the first that I'd like to throw out there is to increase appropriations to the agency to facilitate the headcount necessary to more actively engage the community on advanced manufacturing adoption and implementation. I, I think it's a large agency. It's got a lot of demands on its time. Um, the stress on, on people, I think, in the agency over the last year and a half uh, is just over the top. And uh, user fees are one way to increase revenues, but I, I think you need to look at baseline opportunities 
to grow the research activity and grow interactions with public private partnerships and be out with the community even further to get the headcount necessary. So I, I would argue there's a real need for more resources. The second idea I'll throw out there, and these are not mutually exclusive, is to consider tax incentives for products or processes that adopt advanced manufacturing approaches. Uh, I think this can help a whole variety of companies. It can help um, uh, the those bringing innovator uh, molecules to market. I think it could it could help those that make generics or biosimilars. I think it could help uh, those that are in the contract manufacturing sector. And then the third, again, not mutually exclusive, is is to think about you know, is it possible to have an extended period of exclusivity for products that are first to adopt advanced manufacturing approaches uh, to encourage the, uh, the innovators uh, to debate the business benefit of new technology relative to the risk to timeline? Maybe it's going to take me three more months to get to market if I take a new technology approach, but in doing so, maybe I get an extra year of exclusivity. Um, now, I, there was an idea posted in the ideas on Slido that I, I, I saw that I thought was really interesting, which is um, maybe, maybe it's a question of like a new regulatory pathway, like breakthrough status. Uh, status. Maybe there's a way to think about, you know, a, an approach that relies on advanced manufacturing having some uh, impact on uh, review and, and status for that application. I, I say all this knowing that defining advanced manufacturing is non-trivial if you think about it from a policy perspective. I think it's a little easier for us within the community, but how do you get people on Capitol Hill to think about uh, how to define advanced manufacturing? So it's not just a, you know, a, a Windows update all of a sudden is an advanced manufacturing solution. Um, you know, how do you think about that? So those those are some ideas. On the next slide I, I, is my last slide. I think um, I, I think it's it's a community wide action. So what what can I do? Um, well, I, I think Nimble can commit to hosting follow-up workshops to this one to continue the discussion. I think we need organizations to be willing to engage. Uh, I would ask how often we need to have those discussions and what do we want to accomplish and over what time. But uh, you know, I know as the National Academy's uh, study has uh, fin uh, finishes and as people think about moving forward, I, again, it needs to be a sustained, meaningful discussion going forward. I, I know that I'm willing to help um, advanced thinking around relevant policy action. So happy to take that. But at the same time, I'm leaving uh, some blank bullet points for, I'm, I, I think I and separately Nimble uh, are happy to do more, but we, we want to have a conversation about what we can do and what makes sense. And so want to leave the door open to other ideas that we're certainly willing to engage uh, with in the community and engage in other public-private partnerships and other consortia and other organizations to try to advance the needs of the industry. So with that, I, I really appreciate the time and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lee. I, I think that it was you know, a very good presentation. And I, I love the fact that you highlight that, highlighted that it's not so much about technology in most of the cases. It is about the business risk. I think that we should um, talk a little bit more about that during the community discussion. Um, so with that, now we're going to be moving. Um, so let me introduce the next speaker. The next speaker is Dr. Fernando Muzio. Um, professor Muzio is a distinguished professor of chemical and biochemical engineering at Rutgers University. And for the last 30 years, um, he has been working in pharmaceutical product and process design, um, working on continuous manufacturing, powder mixing, powder flow, segregation, compression, mixing and flow of liquids and suspensions. He has authored over 300 peer-reviewed scientific articles and book chapters. He's a frequent participant of FDA events. And in 2010, from, from 2010 to 2014, he was appointed a, a voting member of the FDA Committee on Pharmaceutical Sciences and Clinical Pharmacology. Dr. Muzio is the director of the National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center on Structured Organic Particle Particulate System. And Dr. Muzio is also the director of the Rutgers Janssen Internship in Advanced Manufacturing and the principal investigator of major FDA research awards focused on material properties, sensing, and process control in continuous manufacturing. Dr. Muzio is also the chair of the faculty committee of NIPTI. Dr. Muzio is also the president of Integra Continuous Manufacturing Systems, a supplier of comprehensive consulting services in continuous manufacturing, and the chief scientific officer of Acumen Biopharma. 
So with that, I'm going to leave the podium to Dr. Muzio. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm honored to be here and uh, I hope I am able to contribute. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, here's my message. I want to give you the message up front. Uh, I'm going to try to be very specific in this talk. Um, we were asked to try to provide uh, actions that could facilitate uh, innovation in the advanced manufacturing space, particularly removing roadblocks. I thought it would be a good idea to maybe focus a little bit on what I think is our uh, best established success in the space, which is continuous direct compression. So um, I think since I think it's easy to argue that this is a successful implementation of advanced manufacturing, um, maybe we want to spend a little bit of time understanding how it happened. How did we get there? What did we do that allowed us to develop a new manufacturing method that now is adopted uh, commercially. And more importantly, perhaps, once we understand how it happened, can we make it happen again? What does it take to replicate the process of going from an idea to a widely implemented methodology? Uh, what would be the roadblocks that we face? And then based on that, uh, how do we uh, enable ways to overcome those roadblocks? So. Um, I'm going to take a very specific view that enabling widespread adoption of advanced manufacturing methods is a catalyst for then other innovations to occur. So next slide, please. So again, why do I say this is a clear success in innovation? Well, first of all, there are multiple FDA approvals of, process, of, of products manufactured this way. More than that, it has become the default first choice in implementation of advanced manufacturing methods for solid dose products. Uh, based on my personal communications with equipment companies, more than 60% of all of the ongoing development projects in the oral solid dose space in continuous manufacturing are continuous direct compression. Uh, there are dozens of projects at Innovators, uh, at least 20 companies, probably more than that. There are six, at least six, established suppliers of integrated technology, meaning you can go to all of these companies and buy an integrated system. Uh, you have to then spend time and effort making it work. But the reality is that um, as a technology sources, there is uh, an established uh, community. Um, I might be forgetting one or two, in fact, but this is by my last count. Um, so in addition, we see already that the implementation of continuous direct compression is moving beyond brand-based pharma and is beginning to go into OTC products and generics. There are also, and there have been for many years, lines available to support development at multiple universities and at CMOs. And perhaps the most significant uh, indicator is that, as was indicated yesterday by Mike Kopcha, CDC graduated from the ETT roaster is no longer considered an emerging technology because it has already emerged, which I take it as a badge of honor. Uh, next slide, please. So how did it happen? Because uh, it's easy to, to think it was inevitable. It's easy maybe to look back and you know, say, okay, it took very long, and uh, but it was always gonna happen. I don't think so. I think that we could have faltered along the way many times. And I think that it was a combination of foresight by the part of the FDA, um, a con series of uh, fortunate circumstances where the funding was available throughout the development cycle um, that got us where we are. And there were people in industry that decided to take a step forward, mainly based on faith and uh, the belief in, in their own technical expertise. But again, it didn't need to happen and maybe it wouldn't have. So what happened? I can tell you personally, from my very personal perspective, um, I know that I'm gonna miss many other contributions, but I was trying to advocate doing this for a while, between 98 and 2002, for example, um, unsuccessfully. At the time, in those years, um, I was proposing, and a number of people in my team were proposing doing this, 
an industry was telling us that it wouldn't happen, that FDA were never gonna allow them to do it, that um, it just wasn't feasible. Next slide, please. Interestingly though, uh, Merck actually had built a partial implementation at the time. This is not a photo of the Merck system. This is a similar system we put together, but uh, it kind of looked like this. Couple of feeders going into a blender, examining continuous gravimetric feeding, continuous blending, looking at results. So there were some uh, earlier efforts. Uh, there were other early efforts besides the Merck one um, happening all while uh, companies were not deciding to move forward. Next slide, please. So then um, something that to me made a big difference was that uh, Janet Woodcock and H.S. Hussein uh, publicly endorsed the concept of continuous manufacturing of solid dose during a camp meeting. I think this was at 2002 in New Brunswick. Next slide, please. That endorsement, which was also uh, incorporated into the PAT guidance, acted as a catalyst. Um, there was a change in attitude. There was interest suddenly in doing this. So CAMP awarded a, some funding to MIT to start experimenting. And at the same time, uh, we were able to form a consortium at Rutgers that included Merck, Pfizer, Apotex, and GIA. And we started working on continuous blending. And that's a picture of the early version of the GIA inclined blender that was the main thing that we were looking at at the time. Next slide, please. So then um, we got the uh, ERC funded by the National Science Foundation in 2006, and we made a strategic choice. It was a choice to implement continuous manufacturing. And we decided to implement continuous direct compression at Rutgers and continuous weight granulation at Purdue. Um, and we implemented also lines at uh, University of Puerto Rico, and we had input from NJIT. There were 40 companies that came on board. Overall, we probably spent in the order of $50 million in continuous manufacturing in the decade between 2006 and 2016. The lucky circumstance was we had access to that funding. Yes. And so the picture shows what I think might be the first complete implementation of feeders, a blender, a mill, a tablet press, PAT, and closed loop control. And this early line, this obviously this uh, academic style line, um, was already up and running around 2008. Uh, Click again, please. Next slide. At the same time, we also started working on modeling tools. Uh, we partnered with uh, PSC. We started building models. We started creating material property databases. I would say FDA joined CSOPS almost from the beginning. I think FDA came on board around 2007 and actually participated throughout the decade. Uh, people from FDA came to our meetings, provided input, encouraged researchers. Uh, actively uh, provided a guidance as to which things made sense and which ones didn't. It was very good to have a forum where we could openly discuss academics, industry, and regulators, uh, basically talk about what we needed to do. Uh, so next slide, please. So then the other thing that I thought was a major step for us was around 2011, J&J &J came along and said, okay, we would like now to develop the GMP version of these. And we form a partnership with multiple equipment suppliers to create what at the time was called the Inspire line, which had Catron feeders, a glad blender, a Comil, and a Feti tablet press. At j, j they implemented with a different tablet press, but a very similar concept. And this received the level of support needed to create this line. The line that you see here is the line at Rutgers, but there was a very similar line built in uh, j, j And there was a lot of back and forth and we actually focused on developing the process for a commercial product, which was Presista, which was approved by FDA in 2016. It was the second product approved by FDA, but it was the first batch to continuous conversion of an approved product. Next slide, please. And since then, many other companies invested in collaborations, both at Rutgers and at Purdue and at other universities, um, as well as at the contract manufacturing sites at sites outside the US in Austria and in the UK, for example. Uh, but the other thing that was absolutely important, once NSA funding was over and we were working on basically with industry, FDA continued to provide support. FDA continued to engage in the process uh, to, 
identify the gaps, to provide funding, to continue to move forward on implementation of process control, on understanding material property effects, on uh, implementing methodologies for real-time quality control. There was a significant amount of resources available in the last five years, uh, which was very critical to getting the knowledge base and also providing the confidence to industry that this is for real, that this is a long-term choice, that we will make it happen. And um, this is a point to maybe stop for a second and realize that all of this needed to happen for us to be now saying that, okay, CDC is an established methodology that we can take out of the emerging technology list because there are other things that need to emerge. Next slide, please. So when we're right, if we want to replicate success, maybe we can figure out on what were the key features that made this possible. So we, I would say, um, had a number of things that don't always happen. One is that the academics were aware of what the problem was that needed to be solved. What motivated this whole thing were quality issues caused by batch blending. Yeah, When we started doing this 20 years ago, the quality problems associated with batch blending of powders and being able to characterize blends and understanding uh, what, uh, what was the state of the, of the material were actually quite difficult. We're at the beginning maybe of PAT implementation and continuous feeding, continuous blending was designed to remove that problem altogether. We were no longer gonna have 500 kilograms of powder in a bucket, okay? Um, the second thing that went right, FDA provided an early statement of regulatory support and a consistent statement of regulatory support throughout the effort. And the most, perhaps the most important third factor was that funding was available across the entire technology life cycle. There was money for early conceptual development, yes? There was money available to support commercial scale implementation. There was money to do multiple demonstrations of the technology, and there were early adopters that were willing to make the leap of faith and make it happen and provide work out examples of how this happens. So next slide, please. What are the roadblocks that could, we could face to replicating the success of continuous direct compression? Well, simply by uh, a logic extension of what I just said, um, there is a lack of shared awareness of what are the manufacturing problems that need to be solved. Um, I would argue that the technology dialogue between industry, the agency, and academia is rather limited. I mean, we speak in some forums, we speak once in a while, and at least from the academic side, eh, the dialogue is really limited to a few senior people. Uh, While well, in fact, those who are going to create the next generation of technology are the early and mid-career faculty and their collaborators in industry, and now their collaborators in the agency that are perhaps at an early stage in their careers. We need better engagement of those uh, of people in, in, that, in those particular circles. Um, this is very critical, particularly because engineers in general don't learn about pharmaceutical manufacturing as undergrads or even as grad students. So we need to think about how do we create a proper conversation forum. Um, the regulatory uncertainty that uh, has been mentioned many times, I'm not going to add to that, it's just to say that I agree with that. There is a lack of early funding for new manufacturing technologies. I mean, I was very, very happy to hear uh, Thomas O'Connor talking about uh, some of the things happening in-house and some of the opportunities through funding. But from a faculty member perspective, from a, from a faculty uh, career perspective, federal funding, particularly in early stages of your career, consistently available, predictably available funding is critical. It's critical to your survival as an academic. So having some type of a, an established funding mechanism for early technology development, right? FDA is providing funding and is greatly appreciated, uh, but in general, the focus of the funding is further down the line for the most part, at least that's the perception from the solicitations. Um, it would be very useful to have sort of like a technology greenhouse across the board. And I understand that Nimble is doing something like that in the large molecule space, and that's excellent. Uh, I think we need to go across the space where there are more opportunities. Then there is 
the problem of the value of death, right? Even when you get funding for an early demonstration, a few hundred K from a company or whatever, and you show that something works, from there to commercial, it can take easily 10 years, it can take easily many millions of dollars. Again, in CSOPs, we had 10 years and we had millions of dollars to make it happen, but that's not the case very, very commonly. So we need to think of mechanisms that would actually identify the things that are likely to contribute. And we need to understand how to form these partnerships where the funding is there, the workforce is there, and the opportunity for commercial scale demonstration is there. I want to emphasize that um, wide implementation or even of continuous data compression, wide implementation across the industry is challenging uh, from the perspective of a company, right? If you're coming into the space now, implementing a line is gonna cost you $20 million, right? A GMP line. Um, it was gonna take three years to get the line up and running from the point where you order the equipment to the point where you qualify and you're ready to start doing work. It's gonna take you another year to develop your process and file it. It's gonna take time to get it approved. So from the perspective of a company coming on board now, they're looking at $20 million and five years of lead time before they actually are approved to make any product, right? Now, that's a very long time for the wide majority of the potential implementers. Continuous direct compression would add value in generic manufacturing, in OTC manufacturing, in supplements manufacturing. It lowers the cost, it improves the quality, but a cost so large and an implementation period that long is a big problem. In addition, Frankly speaking, it, is, it, it takes a fair amount of know-how to do this, and many companies don't have that know-how, and it's hard to acquire it. So those are some of the roadblocks. So here are some proposals to help in remove some of those roadblocks. Let's go to the next and last slide. So if we want to catalyze success in advanced pharmaceutical manufacturing, if we really want to move the whole industry forward so that advanced manufacturing methods become the standard so that they do trigger faster speed to market, improved in quality and lower cost. Maybe we can do is, one thing we can do is to um, build on the CDC success to create momentum. So for example, if we do something to enable widespread implementation of continuous direct compression, if we really push so that it becomes available to any company that could benefit from it, um, we would create more confidence and we would then have an even stronger case study for people who still doubt whether or not they should go in, in this direction. So what do we do to enable widespread implementation? Some of the ideas we already heard and a couple more. One, I think, is to create technology transfer labs that can go all the way from formulation development to supporting a filing. Yeah, Third party places where companies can go and get access to the know-how and the technology, this would remove the lead time and the upfront cost. So companies could actually be filing processes um, without having to create their own line, without having to spend all that money. This would catalyze uh, activities. Um, the uh, companies that are engaged in contract manufacturing now uh, have created some space that can do this, but in general, they're focused on manufacturing, not on development. If they take too many of these development engagements, then it's harder for them to actually do commercial manufacturing. So what we need is, I believe, both resources. The place that would create the formulation and the process, and then transfer that to contract manufacturers that would enable introduction to market of the new product. Uh, second idea, if we are able to do 100% quality inspection in real time, could we think of a regulatory approach for rapid approval. I mean, I want to really ask the question. The technology exists where essentially you can assure the quality of every product unit exhaustively. There is now technology where you can analyze 100,000 tablets an hour. Yeah. What is the risk? Where is the risk? There is risk, obviously, but is the risk still what we think it is? Or could we have a way where if a company really implements a quality system that exhaustively measures every quality attribute in real time, maybe that could have some type of a default rapid approval, which um, would really uh, speed things up. Uh, that actually also would facilitate creating 
platform formulations and platform processes. Again, if I can do 100% inspection and I can assure quality, what is the risk involved in moving from a line A to a line B where the feeders are a little different, maybe the blender is a little different, or maybe the tablet press is not the same brand, but the process operates on the same principles. And I'm still looking at all the quality attributes in both lines with an overwhelming statistical uh, you know, coverage of the, of the things I need to know. Uh, so that will facilitate enormously how processes and products can be developed in one site and then transferred for commercial manufacturing in another site. Um, so that the, the transfer of the processes would really make the business move forward. Um, if we do this, then we probably will see CDC implemented in a much larger number of applications for a much larger fraction of the product that is being produced. And it will provide a lot of momentum for other things. The second thing is we do need Pathfinder programs, programs where we would be able to identify what are the manufacturing problems that require technology solutions, right? Uh, in the context of a dialogue between what the industry needs, what the agency needs, and what academics could do, yeah? And so in the context of a Pathfinder program, have a reliable source of seed funding for technology proof of concept, right? The next bright idea might be to do something completely different than what we're doing now, but where is the money to show that it works in principle? And have a larger pool of people participating in the conversation, have more younger scientists, uh, which uh, could will be the next generation of people doing this. Um, the third item, which is non-trivial, is, and many people struggle with this, is to find technology demonstration and commercialization resources. Find money somewhere where you could go from proof of concept to demonstration and then commercialization. There are some funding sources at the National Science Foundation, and I believe at this, that focus on this, but there isn't a program focused on pharmaceuticals that would say, okay, we have met the criteria for proof of concept of a new technology. Now we need several million dollars to create a demonstration at scale and then to support a company to launch the access to the technology in a commercial basis. And this is one of the key limitations. Um, finally, I think that we need to recognize that even if the knowledge base has become broadly established for a few players, then it's actually very hard to access that knowledge for the rest of the community. Uh, sure, there are now hundreds of papers on continuous manufacturing, but would you really learn how to do it by reading all those papers? Or do you need access to some of the pieces of the puzzle that maybe reside with the people who did the development, right? Like things like, for example, uh, a reservoir of established knowledge where we um, dynamically indicate what is known, what we know works, how to do things, yes? Um, material property databases, uh, things that enable digital design, uh, databases of equipment performance, technology standards so that people can quickly come to an understanding of how to evaluate the process in a way that is satisfactory to the agency and useful to their own implementation. Modeling tools, process control methods, and I could go, go on and on, and I, I, I have been known to go on and on on these things, but my point is, if we really want to have broad acceptance of advanced manufacturing, I think we have to think across the technology implementation life cycle. What does it take to get it from concept to everybody in the industry being able to implement it with a reasonable amount of resources and in a reasonable amount of time? And that's the last thing I was going to say. I want to thank FDA for the vision, the support, the persistence, and I want to uh, praise. I am very impressed with what I heard uh, about the in-house program. I hope that we can continue to work together for many years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Muzio. It was a pleasure to listen to your talks. Um, so let's move on to the next speakers. Um, so now we're gonna have um, Jillian Sanders Schmidtler and Stephen Culver talking. Um, Jillian Sanders Schmidtler 
um, is a professor of population health sciences and medicine at Duke University and deputy director at the Duke Margulis Center for Health Policy. She served as the director of Duke's evidence-based practice center from 2009 through 2020. Dr. Sanders Smithler received her PhD in medical informatics from Stanford and was an assistant professor of medicine at Stanford Center for Primary Care and Outcomes Research from, 1990, uh, from 1998 until the fall of 2003, when she joined the faculty at Duke University. In addition to her leadership role within the Duke Margulies Center, she is a core faculty within the Duke Clinical Research Institute. She is currently co-chairing SMBM COVID Decision Modeling Committee. Um, then we're going to have um, from the same from the same um, group we're going to have um, Stephen Culver. Stephen is a research associate at the Duke Margulies Center for Health Policy, where he is focused on drug supply chain resilience. Stephen is also the co-founder and executive director of RISCS Incorporated, a nonprofit organization with the mission of preventing drug shortages. Prior to co-founding um, this uh, organization in 2019, Stephen held roles of increasing responsibility in business analytics, marketing, portfolio management, finance, and supply chain advisor on Hospira. He worked at the Rocky Mount North Carolina manufacturing site and most recently was director of business analytics team leader at Pfizer Injectables headquarters in Lake Forest, Illinois. So with that, I would like to welcome you guys. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so next slide. So I want to just give you a little bit of background on the Duke Margola Center and, and the work that we're doing relevant to this. And then, and then as um, Sally was mentioning, going to have Stephen dive into some of our, our latest work um, related to this, the innovations. And so the mission of the center is, is to improve health and health equity and the value of healthcare through uh, practical and innovative and evidence-based policy solutions. And really doing this through bringing together an interdisciplinary um, group of faculty and, and research team members and really trying to pull from all the different disciplines. Next slide. So some of the areas of focus um, for the center is on healthcare transformation, where we really try to transform healthcare so it's more accessible, affordable, equitable, and capable of delivering high value care. Um, we then have a, a work stream related to um, biomedical innovation. And so here we're really trying to drive biomedical innovation to change um, and innovate how drugs and devices and medical products are developed and tested and, and regulated and distributed. And then finally, um, having portfolios related to the to global health, and then also educating our, our future generation of healthcare leaders. Next slide. Um, but then specifically to biomedical innovation that we'll be talking about today is really trying to think about how can we improve this and what are the um, regulatory and policy solutions that could make this happen. So we are looking within the center on how we can be enhancing the pipeline and improving how you know drugs and devices and medical products are are, are entering and, and um, are affordable to the patients who need them? How can we lower development costs, finding ways to modernize the clinical trials so that we're more efficient? Advancing the FDA regulatory science and making sure that we're improving the data and the endpoints and the methods of the different regulatory processes. Um, ensuring value, looking to reform payment to support the development and effective use of these new therapies. Um, making sure we're looking to improve market incentives. What are some models that leverage the public and private funding to allow critical areas of need um, uh, of uh, research development? And then also looking at real world data. What are the best ways to use information about how, to, how medical products perform in the real world to make sure that we're providing feedback into product development? So these are a lot of the different areas that we're working on. And I'm now gonna turn it over to, to Steven so he could tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing relevant to today's talk and, and some of the solutions that we're suggesting. Steven. Great, thank you very much, Jillian. And can we go to the next slide, please? And as Jillian mentioned, I'm, I'm Stephen Cobble, also with the Duke Margola Center. And our uh, biomedical innovation work at the center includes looking at supply chain innovation and manufacturing innovation. We actually released a, a white paper earlier this year in July on supporting resilient drug supply chains as a follow on to the White House Executive Order 100 day review report on a similar topic. And I'd like to thank my, my co-authors, 
Thomas Rhodes, Adam Kretsch, and Mark McCullen for all their great contributions to the paper, as well as Marta Wazinska, who was a early collaborator. Um, and also a, a, a huge thanks to NASM for hosting this event over the last couple of days. Um, I've learned a lot and I'm honored to have the opportunity to, to engage with all of you. Um, so through that white paper that I mentioned, we uh, defined pharmaceutical supply chain resilience as meaning that uh, a supply chain where patients have access to safe and effective drugs in the quantities that are needed and when the, the drugs are needed. So of course, producing quality, safe and effective drugs is critical and necessary, but just doing that is not enough. We, we also need to ensure that drugs are produced at the scale that they're needed to and that they're distributed to patients at the time that they're needed and that that can be done consistently over time. Um, in the past, a few factors have contributed to us falling short of that, which you can see on the, on the slide here. We identified four main factors that have contributed to shortages in the past. Uh, the first being market forces. So in the US, there tends to be two extremes with pricing where you have high price branded products that tend to be more expensive than, than other countries. But then on the other end of the spectrum, you also have low priced generic products that tend to be less expensive than, than other countries. And on that low price generic product side of things, Margins tend to be so small for manufacturers that they sometimes have difficulty in investing in the level of resilience that's needed. Um, secondly, geographic concentration contributes to vulnerabilities in, <clears throat> in, in natural disasters, international trade disputes, other things like that. Um, third, quality oversight challenges occur frequently and is quality issues arise frequently. Um, lastly, a lack of transparency in supply chains. There's a uh, a lack of systems to communicate um, to regulators the, the relative supply chain resilience of, of different products so that regulators can track vulnerabilities, but also for buyers and purchasers of pharmaceuticals to be able to observe resilience and reward manufacturers who have strong supply chain, thus incentivize manufacturers to move in the right direction and invest in their supply chains and redundancy and, and other uh, factors that contribute to uh, strong supply chains. Next slide, please. In our paper, we recommend three main policy responses that can help mitigate some of those uh, factors that I mentioned on the previous slide. So firstly, financial incentives can be considered through things like targeted subsidies, tax incentives, pr promoting private sector contracts that are contingent on supply chain resilience and promoting supply chain resilience, and also looking at innovative payment uh, methodologies that can promote supply chain resilience. Secondly, implementing new technologies, especially in, in manufacturing. I'll talk to that here in a second, since that's our, our main focus today and yesterday. But lastly, our, our last recommended policy response is promoting more transparency. The, the CARES Act took some steps in, in, a, in a positive direction for allowing the government to collect more comprehensive data to assess supply chain resilience. Uh, the private sector also needs more information to be able to make better decisions, better buying decisions, better contracting decisions, and being able to di differentiate the relative strength of supply chains and quality metrics from one manufacturer to the next and one product to the next. Okay, next slide, please. Now we'll go into the implementing manufacturing, manufacturing technologies piece in a little bit more detail. Uh, there are some regulatory and policy levers that, that could be considered to spur adoption of, of new innovative technologies. And, all these ideas that I'll go through here are uh, potentially applicable to certain targeted areas and may or may not need congressional action in order to be implemented. Uh, but from a financial incentive perspective, grants to develop centers of excellence is a great is a great step. Uh, there was a, a reference earlier to a, a, a bill that was recently passed in the House on national centers of excellence in advanced and continuous pharmaceutical manufacturing. It's a great example, and there are potentially other programs that could be considered in a similar vein. Um, next, the uh, accelerated reviews and filing fee waivers could be considered for products with, with innovative technology or even something like a priority review voucher that's been used to incentivize <clears throat> uptake of products that are used to treat rare disease, for example. Next slide. From a regulatory perspective, there are some approaches that have been used previously that we could potentially learn from and consider utilizing for new manufacturing technologies, like for example, setting a future date for when older technology may no longer be acceptable. So this was used for 
track and trace, for example, in the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, where a future date was set where manufacturers, if they're not um, complying with track and trace, that'll no longer be acceptable anymore. So that could be considered. Uh, secondly, uh, we could consider setting a grandfathered approval status for, for older technology. This was used uh, when many years ago, um, there were products, well, actually there are still some products on the market that are still grandfathered, but uh, many years ago when there were lots of products that had not gone through the modern FDA approval process, they were given a grandfathered status and manufacturers were allowed to continue marketing those products, but had to implement a plan to move to new technology. And then if a competitor comes to market using the new technology and can supply the whole market, then that approval for the original manufacturer could potentially be, be removed and the, the uh, market could be shifted to the new competitors. So that's something that could be considered as well. Um, of course, collaborating internationally is important and including technology types in the FDA quality management maturity model is another big incentive that could that could um, incentivize manufacturers to participate. Potentially to get a high rating in the quality management maturity model, you need to use a certain level of, of new modern technology. That's something else that could be considered as well. Okay, next slide, and this is the last slide. In terms of next steps at Duke Margolis, we're gonna be conducting further research on these policy levers that were mentioned. If there are any other ideas, we're happy to conduct research on other ideas as well. Look forward to engaging with manufacturers and other stakeholders to identify specific barriers that, that uh, could be considered and, and um, solutions could be, could be, could be um, put together around. And then lastly, and this last couple of days has been great in this last point, is identifying other technologies other than continuous manufacturing that are most deserving of, of potential future pilot programs. We've been focused on continuous manufacturing, uh, but also interested in, in promoting other technologies that can be very impactful as well. So thank you very much again for the time. I appreciate the opportunity and I really enjoyed listening to everyone's presentations and looking forward to a discussion here coming up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you so much, Jillian. That was a great, great presentation. Um, so now we have um, been finalized with the small talks uh, or the short talks um, that we wanted to present. And we're gonna be doing the community discussion portion. Uh, so for this community discussion, um, we encourage the audience to raise their hands in Zoom if you would like to speak up and, and then I can call you. And then if you turn on your camera, we can spotlight you and then you can enter into um, the discussion um, as well. So um, I'll, I'll start a little bit um, the, 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 the questions. And I also want to um, emphasize because we took a little bit longer uh, with the with the different presentations, we're gonna break at eleven instead of at um, ten fifty five as previously um, we have planned. So um, I have a very a, a question just to ignite a little bit of like passion from folks um, in the audience and from the um, panel too. Um, I I really like you know um, what Dr. Lee mentioned about the extension. An incentive could be an extension of a patent, perhaps. Um, for a particular product that it's made with um, more innovative technology. Um, so a question about, about that, um, it will be um, as well, what kind of metrics do you, do you think, if you think of any or the panel, we can utilize to, to ensure that we know that there's a benefit to the society, right? Like if we're gonna be extending a patent to a company who is investing, in their own product and in their own line, um, what kind of metrics can we utilize to ensure that you know we are extending this, but this innovation is supposed to do something for the greater society? Like you know, we were talking about supply chain assurance, or we were talking about process capability, cost, whatever. So I'll I'll just um, leave that there for you guys. Well, maybe I'll. Um quickly react to that by starting and, and saying, um, the obvious thing you might think about is cost, but it, I, I think we've already want, I think this community can acknowledge that cost, cost of goods is probably not related to the, um, to the cost that payers have. So, you know, one possibility is to think about environmental um, sustainability impacts, benefits uh, from intensified processing in that context, for example, but, it would seem to me my point would just be that cost uh, isn't 
is not an obvious one to me, but there may be others. So I think it would be very important to um, identify clearly what the goals are. And I don't know that we really have done that in the sense that there is several conversations going on, uh, including, for example, enabling reshoring of manufacturing, promoting uh, domestic manufacturing at competitive cost. I'm not just talking about the cost of the finished product, I'm talking about the, the, the economic sustainability of uh, the activity so that you know it's possible for domestic manufacturers to produce in the US uh, so that we help mitigate the supply chain issues. I mean, there is conversation about that and there was that report, but uh, has the FDA taken a clear uh, position of incorporating that as a goal for advanced manufacturing or not? I don't see if, the, if that has happened, I haven't seen that connection yet. So in the context of what is it that we want advanced manufacturing to accomplish other than some generic, you know, improving quality by how much? Right? Uh, what is it exactly that we would like to do? What's the desired state five years from now? And how would advanced manufacturing help? And the report is a great first step in that direction, but we don't have a strategic plan, right? An action plan. So that would be my, my sense of what we need to do, create a plan like that. Okay. Anybody else would like to add into that thought-provoking question? So I'd like to chime in here um, and just say that I do think a lot has happened in a short period of time. And one big thing that came out over the summer was the 100 day supply chain report from the White House. And although that might not be at the level of, uh, of what Fernando would call roadmap, I do think it gives a lot of recommendations about how we could get from where we are now to where we go in the future. And, you know, while we're on the subject, I would point out that there was a recent publication from someone who we funded at the University of Maryland, uh, Dr. Cliff Rossi, and he did some financial risk modeling related to implementing continuous manufacturing domestically versus other types of manufacturing around the world. And what he actually showed in his models is that you come out ahead manufacturing continuously in the United States versus the world. And that's even under current tax rates. I know we talked a little bit about tax and whatnot, but even under current tax rates, continuous manufacturing in the US came out ahead of manufacturing uh, traditionally abroad. So I do think there's a lot of things kind of happening that are pushing us in that direction. I agree. I didn't, I didn't mean to sound critical, quite the opposite. I meant to say, you know, I think that we see ourselves with a big opportunity where we can really find what is it that we need to achieve. I think COVID gave us an awareness of a situation that was not really in the public perception before COVID of the need to, um, even from a national security perspective, make sure that we are making enough of everything to take care of our population in the event of, of a situation. And there are many situations that could emerge. I, I think that if uh, you know, we focus also on addressing, for example, how easy it is for FDA to inspect sites and to enforce quality standards when drugs are manufactured domestically versus in other places, um, I think we could accomplish some very important things. And I think advanced manufacturing could help a lot. I'd like to move to the next step where we have a clearly identified you know, set of goals and an actionable plan so that we all have a context in which to spend our efforts so that we know how to help, yeah? Thank and you so just much. Just to add Anybody on to that. Else? Yes, yes, please, Stephen. Sorry about that. Just, just to add on, I think bringing drug purchasers into the equation is also important because that can bring, that can really align incentives for manufacturers to, to implement the technologies that are needed. So the case needs to be made to, purchasers for why using these technologies is important and will benefit them. I think the biggest way to do that is through supply assurance, especially for products that have a high risk of shortage. If, if you can demonstrate that using these advanced technologies reduces risk of shortage, and then transparently demonstrate to the purchasers when you're using those technologies, then they can incentivize the use of those and, and bring manufacturers along quicker. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I just want to point out that um, Mr. Jeff Baker has his hand raised. So if, if um, Jeff, I don't know if you feel like turning on your camera. There you go. 
Um, please. So I, I hope this is in bounds. So just to join the conversation, as we talk about different incentives and things, um, a, a stumbling block that we come up against time and again um, is, is the definition of advanced manufacturing in terms of sort of a bright line rule as opposed to a balancing rule. Uh, I, I think we want to be careful of uh, unintended consequences in, with tax incentives, uh, uh, patent protections, things like this associated with advanced manufacturing because it lends itself to making lists. You know, let's go through the plant and put a yellow sticky on every piece of equipment that is advanced manufacturing. And, and time and again, we come up that advanced manufacturing is, is not a list of nouns. It's about how you do something. And you can have 20 year old equipment that you use in a constructive, innovative, progressive way. You can also buy brand new stuff that you do batch, binary, pass fail, offline release. And, and I think that this is a hurdle and I don't really even have a good suggestion on how to uh, address it, but we need to think about this when we say, oh, we'll give a tax incentive for this or a benefit for advanced manufacturing. How then do we codify? How then do we go to the IRS? How then do we go to the agency and provide these bright line rules of what is or isn't man advanced manufacturing when in fact, it's how we do something as opposed to what we use to do it. That in a buck will get you four quarters, but as we go through and, and think about all these different options, and they're great ideas, we have to also think about the implementation. And I think these things lend themselves to sort of bright line rules as opposed to balancing rules. And that's hard. Thanks for your patience. Thank you so much. That was a great comment. Anybody wants to add to that or just to comment? Uh, yeah, just to add on a little bit, just a point. I think Kelvin brought that up earlier, right? The definition is it is hard to do, and um, certainly found ourselves. And that's why I think in the Purdue Technology Program, we tried to operation that program. We didn't really define it, um, but you know, we had two characteristics. We wanted to have something that we had limited experience with, so it's easy for us to define, and have a on the onus of the sponsor how it's going to improve quality, right? And they can make an argument, and we, we found that uh, valuable. Yeah, you know, we can accept in the program and, and provide the support and, and work together to make that happen. I, I had a thought actually. Um, we are almost talking about implementing advanced manufacturing as, as if that is the goal by itself. Mm -hmm. um, but one could argue that the goal really is to improve product quality, for example, right? If we focus on that, one way I think in which we can move the whole field forward is if FDA really were to uh, ramp up the quality requirements, if you were to require stricter quality demonstrated much more thoroughly across the entire quote unquote batch, uh, the only reasonable way to achieve that for most products would be to implement uh, some type of effective, uh, exhaustive online analysis of quality attributes coupled with, you know, re real time closed loop control. Uh, and whether you're doing it in a continuous or in a batch or whatever, if you're achieving the higher quality standard and you're using tools like modeling, sensing, process control and automation, you are achieving the goal. And that to me fits under the definition of more advanced manufacturing. I think that that would move everybody in that direction uh, as well, uh, right? Um, and then the problem of the yellow stickers disappears because uh, you know, it's a combination of tools that achieves the goal of higher quality. Yeah, and let the market drive all surprises, I think. Alrighty. Thank you so much for that. So um, just we have a couple of other questions in queue. So we would like to extend opportunity to other folks as well. Um, that was a great discussion. So I'm going to go to Slido now. Um, there was a question that was posed yesterday um, by Narendra Baum. Um, who got many likes. So we're gonna go with that question. And the question is, can we create a regulatory incentive for key manufacturing technologies that will advance the whole field, similar to breakthrough status? Um, so that's a question. I know that Narendra is here. So if you if you want to turn on your camera, it's really up to you. Um, but I, I just wanted to read that question that was placed yesterday and got a lot of likes in our Slido.
So if I spoke too fast, I can read it again <laughs> because I know that I speak very fast. Let me go again. So his question was, um, can we create a regulatory incentive for key manufacturing technologies that will advance the whole field similar to breakthrough status? I think, thanks, Ali Narendra here. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, so I was thinking that the breakthrough status uh, designation actually allowed a lot of things to happen from, an, from a sponsor perspective, innovator perspective. It gave uh, real-time access to the regulators, which is often the biggest hurdle for us to actually plan and get something uh, uh, established. So I think that's one uh, aspect uh, of, of uh breakthrough status like designation could provide to the innovators from a benefit perspective is is there is there a breakthrough status for a manufacturing technology that gives us this uh, open door access not just with the ETT which is always there but with actually the reviewers uh, of, of files the actual inspectors who are going to come on site so uh, uh, industry-wide access thank you so let me let me kind of jump in here. Um, you know, one thing I do want to clarify is that the key value of the ETT is that the reviewers are part of that program. So it's not a separate entity. These are people who are who are actively involved uh, in those technologies. And I believe uh, Mike Kopcher mentioned this yesterday, but we had a quality uh, pharmaceutical quality symposium earlier this week, and this topic came up there as well. And someone asked me about regulatory incentives for advanced manufacturing. And you know, one thing that I wanted to point out here that I, that I also pointed out there is that in the Emerging Technology Program, if you look at the approved applications, uh, in almost all cases, they've been approved ahead of their user fee goal date, the typical user fee goal date, right? And a big thing that we hear is people are worried about the risk of implementing these things and delaying the approval of their product. If you actually look at the data, though, it's the opposite. Uh, in many cases, these things have been approved in advance of when something typically might be approved. And so I just want to relate that a bit to this idea of breakthrough status. A number of the advanced technologies we've seen have been used to manufacture breakthrough products, right? And so that alone brings an accelerated timeline that we've been able to meet via the Emerging Technology Program. And then the other thing I just want to point out very quickly is that often what you see in new drugs is that the rate limiting step is the clinical, right? It's not necessarily the CMC that keeps things from, from being approved, right? So I want to make sure that we, we keep our eyes on the factors that kind of matter that drive us to the place that we want to be. And I think that place needs to be focused on improving things for the patient, right? And so Fernando had, had mentioned the idea of having higher quality standards and that sort of raises the bar and you need advanced manufacturing. And I think it's important to keep in mind that no matter what you do, it needs to result in a safe, effective product for the patient. If that's a, an existing technology, so be it. If that's an advanced technology, perhaps there are some advantages that could be realized from, from doing that. And I always keep in mind there's this hierarchy of quality, right? So there's product quality, there's process quality, and then there's quality management. And I think what we're talking about here a lot is somewhere between the process quality and quality management step. And that's what makes people confident that the things that they manufacture can be released, every single one, without any disruption in supply. And so that's kind of my take on this, at least. Any other comments with regards to that? If not, let's move. Um, we have another question um, from Tim. Tim, um, if you can show your, your face in the camera. <laughs> if you want, if not, then um, we can find another question in a Slido. There you go, Tim is coming. Thank you, Tim. Hey, Sally, and I'm trying to remember what my question on Slido was because I was waiting <laughs> for something else. Oh, this was about the incentive. So we've been talking about that. Uh, and, and I actually probably would upvote a couple of the other comments in there. I think Rob Denard had, had one or two that were related to this. 
uh, as well. And, you know, it, it's about the dynamic within the companies, you know, I think where, where a lot of this resides. And so if we can reflect on it and try to find ways to change that dynamic uh, to one in which there's a pull coming from, from uh, uh, people within the company rather than the bottoms up push of look at this technology, you know, to Adam's point, uh, you know, it's not going to slow you down, don't worry, <laughs> to what can you bring forward in the advanced technology space as a part of this product? That would be dramatically different than the history has been, you know, because reality, you know, the people that run the projects typically are, are focused on the clinical, the label and the timeline. And, you know, they are very worried about all of those risks alone as they, as they will impact the business. And those the management folks are concerned about anything that will add to that risk or timeline. Uh, and so even as, as Adam said, if the data are there, a lot of it is because there's been a lot of reticence about still, you know, what, what you end up seeing uh, there because of those concerns. And I think flipping that, if, there, if we can find ways to drive those incentives in the other direction, you know, and having people calling from up above down into the, into the manufacturing and process teams and saying, what can you bring us here? Because we want these advantages. That would, would, would be, you know, it's kind of a soft thing in a way, but it could actually change the dynamic. Yeah, maybe if I just build a little bit on that and, and tie it to some of Adam's comments. I, I mean, I think it's, I, I think the, it, if there hasn't, I think if the data shows there hasn't been significant delays associated with new technology adoption, um, I think that's key and important information to share broadly. But the flip side of that coin is there may be other approaches and technologies that companies have decided not to pursue and put forward because of, because of what they perceive as potential delays. And, and I think those decisions, my sense is, are, are made early um, in development. So yes, clinical is gonna be the slow step, but companies have to think about what approach they're gonna to take to manufacturing. And that decision is gonna come relatively, I think, on the earlier side of things. And so uh, as, as Tim was reflecting, if, if those conversations today are, you know, what is our risk of whether we get this product to market or not, and how fast can we do that? with current technology, if, if there's now a conversation that has to happen, well, we can do it with current technology and get what we know we're gonna get. But if we have a better way to do this, that will yield other benefits and will also take some additional business benefit, maybe it's worth pausing for a moment to think about whether we take an advanced manufacturing approach versus a, call it a traditional one. And I say that recognizing Jeff's comments about whether advanced manufacturing is a technology or, or perhaps a philosophy. Uh, and, and I think that's a really important consideration as well. Right, yes. Um, I just want to like point out it's 11.01 and we have a break now. Um, I, I don't know if any, I don't know if uh, the academies want us to take one more comment or if we should break. And then whenever we come back to um, session five, a path forward, we're gonna have another community discussion. So we can all take a break now and perhaps um, save some of the thoughts and questions for the next session, which is gonna be, again, an another community discussion. What do you recommend, Linda? Um, it looks like maybe a break would be good just to get people to up and get the blood flowing. Um, but the next session is really open floor. And I think we have a lot of comments coming in from Slido that we would probably bring up in the next session. And um, I don't know um, if the speakers are gonna be, uh, I know you all have very busy schedules, but it would be great if um, you all could also participate as audience members and we just get the floor open and bringing people on stage to discuss their ideas. So um, I think a break would be good and then moving on to session five to continue the conversation. Excellent. So, so we're going to take a break now and then we'll come back at 11 and 10 for the next session, right? Excellent. All righty. Well, thank you so much. See you guys soon. Uh, very good. Um, so I um, appreciate those of you that are persevering and staying with us. Um, just to recap uh, what the design has been of this workshop, we started out with session one. Uh, we were really, we're focusing on 
revisiting the technology uh, inventory that the committee had put together and, and identified as being those technologies that are uh, the FDA uh, can expect to see within the 10 year horizon. Uh, then in the second session, uh, we looked at, you know, some of the, uh, the, uh, the challenges that, uh, that uh, innovation um, uh, encounters. And we saw some very interesting response from the FDA telling us exactly how they've um, taken uh, on some of the recommendations that the committee made and some of them they chose not to pursue. Um, we then went on with uh, a gap analysis. So the idea here was again to revisit some of the issues that the committee had identified and the solution that we proposed and, and identify things that we had missed. Um, and then uh, the session we just uh, uh, experienced together uh, was to now point to those gaps uh, and identify some ways we could address them. And we certainly had some very exciting uh, presentations given by uh, a number of the participants that really uh, outlined a whole set of suggestions and ideas. And I guess the, by design, the purpose of this session is to say, okay, we looked at this whole path. We have a whole selection of possible avenues to pursue. So what really should we do? You know, what should the community do? And I think that's a really important part because uh, it is relatively easy to say, well, you know, we dump it all in the FDA's lap and it is for them uh, to worry about enabling uh, introduction of new technologies. Uh, we really need to take ownership as a community uh, and figure out what can we do collectively uh, to move things forward. And I think there have been a number of, of strategies that you know, we have uh, identified. And certainly I would say the examples provided by, by Kevin and, and Fernando of, of basically um, um, you know, industry university government partnership that bring together segments of the community to address focused issues. And I think the notable part of, for example, Nimble and CSOPs is that these, you know, did not um, majorly require FDA financial support, right? There are other sectors of the government, NSF, NIST, that actually helped underwrite it. Uh, and and I, I think, um, likewise, one doesn't need to rely entirely on government funding. It's conceivable that industry consortia could get together and move forward uh, certain subjects. Uh, there are other, um, you know, issues that, that were surfaced about globalization. And, and certainly we saw a number of ideas of promoting communication between the regulators, accelerating the adoption of new technology by having the regulators get together and look at them jointly. Um, so uh, there was ideas, for example, of, of uh, some kind of uh, memorandum of understanding. So when ETT, uh, uh, addresses a new issue, they bring in some of their collaborators from, uh, from Europe or Japan and, and do it in some sense jointly so that the company is not doing this serially. I mean, these are some of the things that um, uh, some of them can point to the community, some of them can point to the FDA. And I think what we want to do in this session is to really get your input on what you think are the most productive ways to move forward. Uh, clearly, we need to engage the community. Uh, we need everyone to participate to move advances in manufacturing forward. Um, and that's the purpose of our session here. Uh, and with that little uh, uh, introduction, I guess what I would like to encourage you now is to um, fire away with questions and, and ideas um, that we can post and, and discuss uh, as a group. Uh, Tim, I see you on the screen. Does this mean you want to say something? Well, it means that I'm happy to join <laughs> and get <Okay. laughs> and, and encourage others to. I certainly don't want to, you know, take take more more space than than uh, is absolutely required because we really would love to get people to chime in here and 
you know, get a conversation going. So, you know, the more faces we can see, I think we want as free flowing a discussion as possible here, not, you know, depend on Slido, you know, for this next step, but to try to get, get, uh, get something moving quickly. And I, I guess I would say, you know, I'm certainly happy to raise my hand for what I can do uh, to help going forward. And, and, you know, I would love for both mechanisms to be created for ongoing conversation. I know Kelvin has suggested some follow-up workshops for this. And, you know, I have been in communication with people in various forums as, as we've been going along here, you know, and it's clear that people wanna contribute. And I think my view would be that we wanna take advantage of both the, the momentum and the energy of folks throughout the ecosystem to try to advance, you know, this, this mission uh, going forward. I totally agree with the, you know, many people's comments that, that you know, this is a community thing. And, uh, you know, I, I really hope that we can find ways to, you know, not say, well, it's your thing, it's your, uh, our thing, not ours, whatever, but it's all of our thing. And, you know, then for, you know, people to take action, you know, and I, I, I really liked uh, the, the idea uh, that, that, that we heard uh, Earl, earlier, uh, you know, first, even a strategic plan, you know, collectively as a community that's actionable, I think is, is a brilliant, you know, and really required thing if we're going to make a cohesive stab at this. So thank you for that. Uh, I think that was Fernando's uh, uh, comment and I and, uh, really appreciated that. Yeah, no, I also appreciated Kevin's uh, focus uh, on the fact that uh, it's all about patience because certainly when you get to be my age, you realize that you know, you have, you're imminently to be a patient. So you have some, some uh, enlightened self-interest to pursue there. You know? And I, I know Tim is a young fellow and our young ladies here, they're, they're way past worrying about these things, but, uh, but I certainly do. So uh, now uh, uh, Kelly or Sally, did you want to offer some comments? Yeah, you can I'll start first. Okay. Sure. Um, so one of the things that strikes me is clearly there's a lot of effort going on inside the FDA to promote innovation. And clearly there's a lot of effort external to the FDA to promote innovation. Um, and yet it seems that there's not great alignment either in the timing, the focus, or you know, it's it's almost like parallel efforts that intersect. Um, only with um, more heroic right, interactions right, a across the ecosystem because connections only between regulators and academics or regulators and you know, government or you know, other, other government, um, it, it really is the community and the ecosystem you know, working together that needs to happen, not just sort of bilateral, right? Um, even though everyone has their individual spheres of influence um, that work. So it, I know that the committee, as we thought about writing the report and you know, considered the larger community effort, um, it, the alignment of all of these efforts is, is really, um, in my mind, the sticking point. You know, the starting and stopping of government funding can be a problem, right, that is not necessarily controlled uh, you know, it, within any agency's control, since that one has a, an appropriations component to it. Um, and then, you know, changes in leadership at different con country, uh, companies and the cultures, you know, risk aversion and all of that. Um, so it, it is a, a complicated problem with a lot of moving parts. My point is, I, I guess, is that I believe that there are a lot of existing assets, but it is the in incentives and the alignment of the incentives um, where I would recommend we focus efforts. And I, I mean, I, I would like to add a little bit to that. I think that um, just like Kelly, I would like to start by acknowledging all the efforts that I have seen at the FDA. Um, I think that, you know, like we started again with a PAT initiative. That's something that needs to be acknowledged that it, it was a very strong document. It was um, very change, uh, like a game changer. Um, I think that it's something that started at a point that, you know, when you are ahead of everybody else, that you're way, 
ahead of the future, like you're almost there. So I think that the vision is there. I think that the support is there. I think that it's now, it, it's gonna be like companies, when, when we hear about these things, and this is my perspective, like this is not the, the, the National Academy's perspective, this is mine as working in the industry. I think that when companies hear a new term, um, or there's a new initiative, like everybody jumps, uh, jumps to it, everybody wants to use it just to ensure that their management sees that they're trying to innovate and stay ahead to the curve. Um, but sometimes I think that the reasons are not very clear of why we're doing it. And I think that the business case is not very strong. And I think that this is something that Rob Gennard brought um, in the chat too. Um, I think that if we do an analysis and we stop and we start understanding that not all of our processes are monolithic, that we start understanding that we don't, I mean, there are products that we just make once every two years. And there's one, pro, there are products that we make 25 batches a year or more or 100 batches a year. So the needs for advanced technologies is really gonna depend on the product. Um, so I think that it might be, might be, and this is not something that should be on the shoulders of the FDA. I think that this should be in our shoulders as an industry, um, perhaps leveraging like Limbo or leveraging the International Academies of Engineer, Automation Engineer, like these other avenues that we have is to start really thinking about it from a business perspective. We love technology. We love to start talking about artificial intelligence and data analytics and all the sexy things, but are we stopping and thinking about the business and about the patient, what we're doing for our society and why we need pharmaceutical uh, industry? It's not like makeup industry. It's not like a cell phone industry. I mean, we are almost like, think about it, about like we are providing medicines to our population. It's, it's almost like a hospital. We're almost like, you know, you think about what we are doing right now. Um, and and we, we need to start thinking, what are we providing to our society? Um, or what impact we are having to our society? So I think that once we start seeing not only about the technology, but the business processes, the impact that we are having, why there's a need to change, right? Because it's about change at the end of the day then perhaps, you know, we're going to start finding, finding common ground. But if we're just still talking about, you know, the algorithm and we talk about like the, the Raman and the NIR, and then we still kind of like fall into that conversation, I don't think that we're going to be able to make um, like, a, like a strong move in our industry. So um, that, those are my two cents. Can I jump in? Because okay. I would like to respond to both uh, team and Kelly. Um, so a couple comments. Number one. There is a potential major opportunity coming up, which is this bill for the Centers of Excellence, which has passed the House three times, which would place $100 million at FDA for Centers of Excellence in Advanced Manufacturing. Right? Um, I wanted to suggest, I think since it passed the House three times, we can hope that eventually it will become uh, a law and, and the resources will become available. Um, FDA could do something in the meantime, which would be very, very useful, I think, which is something that needs does and that uh, the uh, EDA has recently done, which is basically to fund uh, small size uh, planning grants, asking universities that intend to become the centers of excellence to develop a roadmap for implementation of advanced manufacturing. That those grants can be you know, in the 200K to 500K each, but they provide a process by which universities convey industry into a dialogue to focus on goals and how to get there. Um, I think that in terms of a strategic plan, right, the, the strategic plan, uh, you know, again, could, could be many things, but it would be very interesting to have a clear statement of goals, what do we want to accomplish, right, specifically, and then focus on pathways to get there uh, that leverage everybody's contributions and, and potential, you know, and give an opportunity for all the different voices to chime in as to what are aspects that I might not know about, and you know, maybe a team knows about or somebody else, and, and we can then engage in the dialogue. But I think it needs to be goals, you know, outcomes driven. To Rex might remember that we use that all the time in CSOPs. I think outcomes driven is important. What are the outcomes we want? By when do we want them? Which steps will get us there? And uh, I want to mention, you know, CSOPs and Nimble and things like that, even camp happened because there were, you know, faculty that got together with a couple of companies and push. It wasn't in response to a grand vision. 
that was, you know, trying to address issues of supply chain or issues of quality or issues of cost. If we had had that grand vision, if we had had those goals clear, I think we would have done many more things. It was all driven by happenstance to some extent, right? So, you know, luck is not a plan, right? So why don't we create a plan? That, that, that's an excellent idea, but uh, a follow-up suggestion was, you know, within which framework do you envision um, launching these exercises? Well, I think there are multiple opportunities, right? So FDA has some um, funding available and FDA could make the choice, for example, to say in the next solicitation, we would like to award two or three planning grants for you know, universities that would eventually like to create these centers of excellence to begin to articulate how they would do it, right? And who would they work with, et cetera, that would gain us a lot of time, right? Because otherwise we're gonna to have to do that anyway in the context of rushing to write those proposals for those centers of excellence if and when the bill gets funded. And if the bill doesn't get funded, these planning efforts might be useful in the meantime, right? How do we get to a truly portable contained, you know, inside a glove box manufacturing system? What does it take to make it GMP, but portable, right? All the thinking that goes into that could be done with a relatively small amount of money. It's the planning, right? I think that that would be very useful. Other thing is FDA could reach out to the other federal agencies that have a vested interest in this, right? There is money in other places. There is the Economic Development Administration right now. The military have indicated that they are very interested in this, right? BARDA, DARPA, they're funding things that are relevant to FDA. NSF, you know, other agencies have gone to NSF to create new ARCs targeting certain needs. There's absolutely no reason why FDA couldn't again approach NSF and say, hey, how about we invite solicitations for ERCs seeking to accomplish X, Y, and Z, right? Um, all of those are long-term programs. And that's the message is that technology, successful technology implementation takes a long time. And, and most companies do not have currently the philosophy that allows them to implement this long time development efforts, right? I mean, many, many companies don't do that. So um, the, the frameworks could be based on the existing long-term centers. They need a twist towards technology implementation and technology transfer rather than fundamental research. Well, that's, that's great, Fernando. Thank you for, for that. Those are real, really helpful comments. It looks like we're getting some interest here. And I just, Linda and Sally, speak up about how you want to run this part of the process. Uh, you have in the chat, you know, but if folks, it, uh, it, I think what we were thinking of is if you t if you just turn your camera on, we can bring you forward and uh, we can get, get things going. We don't have to use the hand raising uh, necessarily, if you find that it's going to be chaotic, you know, we can, we can dial back, but we want to get the voices going and it's exciting to see that people are looking to speak. Yeah, I think, uh, Tim, you hit it on the uh, nail there. Um, this session is going to be a bit more chaotic in the sense that we really want the community to see each other, to talk. Um, just imagine that we're in an actual room physically. And, um, so if you feel the itch to talk, to just talk, um, we don't really need a call on you. Just unmute yourself and just chime in. And we'll see how it goes. That's dangerous, but let's see how it goes. <laughs> well, you know, uh, um, we have a raised hand there. Uh, mm -hmm. Please go ahead. We had Janine, who was very brave, so. <laughs> well, I was going to take the conversation off in a slightly different direction, so I don't know if uh, Kelvin or, or somebody else wanted to continue um, what Fernando was talking about just then. I, I can just maybe offer two sentences and then um, if that's okay and then kind of we can go in a new direction. So I, I, I want to say that I, I do like the idea that we would have some kind of broader strategic vision and, and plan. I, I like the idea of um, engaging as much of a cross-section of the community as possible. I, I think uh, identifying resources uh, is really important. And if that means in investing and in helping the academics define that vision, because academics are really good at convening, I think that's important. I, I think a, a risk there though is 
um, at least what we've seen in our part of the community is that the academic community is much is years behind uh, current industry thinking and knowledge. And, and so I think it really, we want, I would argue that whatever plan we develop as a community really needs to be led from the industry side because they're the ones with the state-of-the-art knowledge. They're the ones with the proprietary knowledge on what's uh, where they're going. And uh, finding a way to have them lead the discussion, I think is gonna be critically important. And so, and of course they're resource limited as well. Um, you know, coming up with a national strategic vision for this is not in uh, maybe the most obvious thing. So with all of the alphabet soup of agencies that are relevant, you know, that one concept I'll put forward is maybe this is something in the context of domestic supply chains and resiliency access to medicine. Maybe it's, a, it's an OSTP um, led discussion about how multiple agencies can coordinate to facilitate that conversation. Thanks very much. Kelvin, very good point. It, it, we, we do need to get the, the industry uh, direction setting uh, because uh, it is quite true that us, us academics uh, like to pursue our favorite topics, not necessarily the ones that have the most impact. But the trick is how to, how to convene that. Uh, that's really the challenge. Yeah. I, I wonder, just following off uh, up on that, just very briefly, if there's a way that we can leverage the data that is coming in from the request to ETP to identify some topic areas that are of broad interest where there can be a industry regulatory academic discussion. Uh, one that comes to mind is, you know, rapid micro testing or machine learning. Those are topics that I heard multiple times during these two days. And while it's great that ETP exists for um, FDA to engage bilaterally with companies on these topics, it seems, and I think Fernando mentioned this in his talk, like a little bit of a missed opportunity to not be able to share, you know, the, the broader feedback with the entire industry on those topics that everybody's interested in. Just a thought. I'm uh, I do want to I do want to comment on the oh my apologies. How about you go first, Jay? No, no, yeah, no, go ahead, yeah. no, go ahead, Larry. No, I do want to uh, uh, comment on this. I think uh, we agree. I think one of the uh, ETP uh, 2.0 is to enhance communication, but I do want to say that uh, these informations are out there as well. Uh, in the ETP website, uh, we actually list uh, the type of technology we have engaged. But I do want to make sure that some of these uh, information uh, somewhat like we can only share like at the high level in, in our opinion in, in a certain way. But like those uh, broad topic, what we have uh, looking at uh, is, already, is already in some of, is already in the uh, ETT website. So I think I encourage you guys to check it. And then we will also update the website uh, regularly. But thank you. Uh, Janine, would you? We, we need to give you the floor here. Thanks. Uh, just to that point as well is that I, I'm in an incredibly um, privileged position because now, after 18 years as a regulator at MHRA, I'm um, now writing for IPQ, uh, International Pharmaceutical Quality, and so I get to go to lots of conferences. And, and I was like listening to FDA and industry at conferences sharing the dialogue on new technologies is quite phenomenal and, and other regulators too. And, and so I guess I get the image that there is a lot of communication going on. And so it's quite surprising to, to hear that, um, you know, the messages aren't always getting out. And, uh, and I think that's a huge, thing that we could potentially um, help with because we that's what we like to do is to um, enable the dialogue and, and share the ideas that are discussed at conferences, but also maybe engage more uh, academia at um, conferences or at least enable them to go to these conferences that are run by membership organi organizations that bring regulators uh, and industry together to share ideas and, and certainly going to so many conferences, the, the thing that we hear over and over again is, is about 
new technologies and the nervousness of bringing in the regulators, um, the worry about sharing things um, in case you say the wrong thing and that sends the regulators off on a different path. But, but coming to the point that's been made really, really well by um, Fernando and uh, Kelvin and, and others about the global issue, because from my understanding and what I hear so often is that making changes with FDA, with MHRI, with, with some of the other regulators is, is really great. There's, there's lots of good opportunities with the ETT, the innovation offices and things like that. But, but when it comes to other regions, the, the challenges there of, of trying to make changes is as others have already highlighted in the report showed, it is, is a huge challenge and most companies are global and, and the challenges that they have to go through, the, the length of variations, uh, it's, it's a big blocker. So I'd like to come back to that conversation and, and see what else can be done about it. I did suggest that possibly with all the fantastic work that FDA are doing that, um, you know, with the training as well that's going to be going on, then is there any possibility of, of sharing that with all the digital tools that we've got over the last 18 months or so? Is there any chance of being able to bring in the other global regulators for um, more you know, discussion in, the, in using those tools? Uh, thank you, Janine. I, I think we should switch to John. He's been patiently in the queue. Uh, John, would you like to hold forth? Yeah, sure. Uh, I've, I've got two uh, things that, that I wanted to say. One, since we've been talking about uh, regulatory agencies. So uh, there was an interesting comment that uh, you know a lot of the things that have come through the uh, ETT have been approved uh, on time. I'm not sure, and I don't know uh, if we have data on this, whether the problem with new technologies is that the FDA says no to them, or people just don't have the confidence to even approach the FDA. I, I think there, there's, there's a, there are a huge number of, of technologies that never even get to that point. And so one specific thing I think that we could do would be to think about ways to increase people's confidence in approaching uh, the FDA and not just saying, ah, no, they'll, don't, they'll never approve that. So that's one thing. And, and then the other thing is that we can have a, a, a manufacturing strategy, but I'm thinking there, there are roadmaps that exist. And, and I think what we really need are specific projects that specific companies want to work together with specific consortia to push over the finish line because that's how you really get uh, things moving. Very good point. Uh, thank you, uh, Rob. Uh, I believe you were in the queue next. Great, thanks. Yeah, it's great, great conversation. Um, really excited to hear all the conversations going on. One thing that I kind of think about in all of this, and you know, I kind of like what Sally was talking about, sort of like, you know, you know, in the early 2000s, we had 21st century GMPs, PAT stuff, right? I think there's a lot of lessons that we can kind of learn from that. And I think one of the lessons is, is that, and, and I've heard in this conversation, probably the word change um, a thousand times, right? And so I think, you know, one of the things about change is that you have to, you have to really manage a change as a change, right? And there's a lot, there's a, there's capabilities on how you manage change, right? And I, I don't see a lot of those necessarily being applied to this big problem, right? So we're trying to move a complex dynamic system of this whole thing, right? We're trying to modernize uh, the industry, right? And there's incentives, there's, there's investment, there's technology, there's all these things, but we haven't really kind of put it all together. Like if I was, you know, to hire a consulting group to come, come in and manage this as a change, Right. I don't necessarily see that we're taking sort of that social science approach to this. And for me, and ha having done this in different organizations, the more that you can kind of apply that, the better things start to work. And we've talked about a lot of key concepts, like what is the future state? Where are we now? What are the steps? Like, you know, we we're talking about a strategic plan. Um, there's a lot of different stakeholders. Where are they on this journey? Right. And there's sort of a whole management process that has to go on. And so for me, like one of the things I think about is actually taking a step back and saying, where are we? Where are we trying to go? And I think, you know, some of the folks from Duke were kind of talking about sort of like from a healthcare system, 
because I think I think the technology, like we do want to move the technology forward, but we have to understand why are we doing it and how it, and who's benefiting, and then the change process around that. So, so I'll I'll kind of stop there. But I see there's a lot of opportunities there, and there are a lot of barriers, but there's also a lot of things that are on our side, a lot of key enablers too. And there's a lot of good discussion going on. But like, if I were to think about managing this change, the the resources that are managing the change are very diluted. I, I there's there's probably like there's so many different you know bodies and you know sort of conferences I can go to, but it's not concerted, right? It's just it's kind it's kind of more of a shotgun approach. So can we start to you know consolidate that? And you know one of the change philosophies that you know we've kind of adopted is. You know, it's if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, right? And and there is a real a piece of that around us going together, but it's hard to go together when together is is fragmented. So just want to make those couple comments. Excellent, very very valuable comments. Uh, uh, Stelios, uh, would you like to uh, um, get the floor? Sure. Uh, thank you. And and it's it's exciting to see so many experts here and, and the diversity of thoughts. And I will, I will uh, continue along the lines that Rob said. I, I think what we are, while we have a great strategy and thinking, I believe what's missing here is the business case, the business case to support why advanced manufacturing makes sense. And, and that's why we should implement that and um, I will speak mostly from my experience in industry. I spent most of my career in industry now in the, in the regulatory agency. But one of the things that Fernando pointed out, rightly so, is that we haven't identified as industry the cost associated with defects, with the processes that we currently use and the efforts that we put in to investigate deviations, to deal with um, loss of product that at the end it's beyond expiry date because we keep manufacturing it in batches and then we stock it up because we don't we want to have the flexibility to have it available there. So I think an area where um, industry and academia can work together and where academics can help is actually enabling industry truly assess the cost with lost product and defects. And uh, I believe that could be a factor that will, um, uh, uh, will play a role in putting a business case that if we implement advanced manufacturing, it gives us flexibilities on, on, our, uh, on the stock that we need to have. It gives us flexibilities to move from one product to the other and minimize the losses, I believe we may be able to, to push industry to, toward that direction. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Uh, Jack, you've been patient. Uh, would you like to take the floor? Oh, oh, sure. Yeah, maybe just to comment on John's question about sort of FDA encouraging innovation. I mean, I think I made this point when I spoke last year, or was it two years ago, <laughs> that, you know, we're governed a little bit by the least common denominator. I mean, perhaps, you know, some companies have the scale where they can have a U.S. dedicated, you know, plant or production line and really push that line to the limit of what the FDA would encourage. But ultimately, you, you need at least to serve you know, in, in, in a first round, the EU and the US. And so you're looking to look at commonly what, what can be done. Um, and, and if you're looking at, uh, at, at change, right? Our first goal is to get to market uh, as soon as possible. I actually was in the hospital with a relative yesterday and a key drug she need has a PDUFA date of January 28th. And God, I wish it was January 1st. So ultimately, you know, and there's a lot of patients like that. So our first goal is to get drug to patients fast. And so you don't wanna take anything that would slow that critical path down. And that starts with your early clinical data. And every time you, you, know, you can scale in the clinic, but ultimately get to, get to market fast and then do the innovations later potentially, but that's, then you've got to manage the supply chain of many, many markets. Um, you know, the question that I put in was, you know, the suggestion earlier of kind of bright line, definitions of incentives for innovation technologies. And I was just maybe a little bit cynically worried that, you know, do we have good examples of innovative approaches that you would incentivize? You know, if I put a digital twin somewhere on my on my line, is that 
innovative, you know, if I put PAT somewhere, I mean, you can have very superficial implementations or very transformational ones. I, I don't have the answer, but it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a minefield. Very good. Thank you, uh, Jack. Uh, Tom, I, I believe you've been trying to get back in. Uh, would you like to uh, take the floor? I, I I didn't have anything to add, so I don't know whether it's just because my video is on. Oh, okay. But uh, no, I agree. I, I think this is a great discussion. I, I actually am thrilled to be part of it and glad that we're having it, but I'll let others speak. Okay. Now, Sally, did you, uh, I know your hand's up and I'm not supposed to give committee members priority, but you're very important. Thank you <laughs> so much. Um, no, I just I just want to piggyback into what Rob um, Gennard said, um, because I, I think that I don't know, you know, when we're talking about business case and we're talking about um, stakeholder analysis, uh, many times, you know, like we like, again, let's go back to the PAT initiative and start talking about incentives and, and, ben and benefits for pharma, uh, right, for the company itself. Um, I think that we should pause and then think, okay, what are the different benefits that we have for stakeholders? I don't think that we have done that exercise and saying, you know what, these are the benefits of some technologies, right? Because not all of the technologies are gonna have the same benefits or not all the innovations are gonna have the same benefits uh, to pharma, to the, the business itself. These are some benefits for the society. And by the way, these are some benefits for the agency too, because they have to, I don't know, I'll give you an example. Like we were talking about you know, the quality metrics and that project, that, that program, I don't know the status of it. I think that is gonna like, there's gonna be a revision to it, but that is actually to benefit the agency as well, right? Because now they don't have to be doing, um, you know, they don't have to be investing some, so many resources in, in going and, 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 and visiting companies just to check on the status of where they are at. So I think that that's gonna be important because what, in my opinion, one of the reasons um, of, of why some of the technologies have failed is because we have we have tried to put the same benefit for all of the technologies when there's not it's not the same benefit. Now, like uh, as an example, not everything is going to be ending up in real time release. So and and it should not right now that might not be the benefit. The benefit is might be saving a batch or it might be not having so many inspections or it might be uh, I don't know like any other. So I think that we have to. In my opinion, like one of the things that we have been trying to be like too black and white about the adoption of technologies, and and it's not it's not as simple as that. That's it. Thank you for that observation, um, uh, Adam. Would you uh, you you're you're in the queue, and I'm not sure which comment you're responding to, but please do. <laughs> let let me try to respond to a couple actually. Um, the one that I wanted to mention was this idea of saying more about the technologies and emerging technology program. Um, and a point that Larry hit on earlier was that, you know, we have to adhere to confidentiality, right? So we rely on companies to go out and say that they're part of the program and what technologies are part of the program. And once they do that, then we can talk about them. But before that happens, we can't really say anything. So I think that's a great opportunity where we could kind of work together to increase the visibility of some of this stuff and maybe de-risk a bit in the eyes of the decision makers. And then the other thing that I, I did wanna mention in terms of a potential path forward, uh, and I'm not speaking as a regulator here, I'm speaking as a scientist. I see a lot that can be done in the pre-competitive space, right? And a good example, I think, is this whole idea of microbial testing, right? Uh, we shouldn't be using tests that they used in the 1800s as we're also talking about implementing artificial intelligence, right? It just seems like something that is discordant. And I think the technologies are out there. That's the frustrating part. Over the last 20 years, the advances that they've made in microfluidics and cytometry and labeling, those things should be able to be pulled together in my eyes to give you better microbial testing. And I know there are some efforts. I believe Nimble has a project that, you know, that they funded in order to develop a rapid microbial testing and there, and there are some other tests out there. But that's the type of thing where I see people with different types of IP coming together in a pre-competitive space to make this possible for everyone. And we didn't really need a better mousetrap to this point, which is why we still have the 1800s method in place. But as we do take this more real-time approach to manufacturing, 
I think we are at a point where that old mousetrap doesn't work. And those are the types of things that I do believe people could come together in a pre-competitive environment to work on. Uh, very good, thank you for that. Uh, I noticed there, Fernando, did you have a question to pose? No, that, that is from about half an hour ago. Oh, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, between chat and and you know Slido and whatever, it's hard to keep track of where we are. Um, I don't see uh, anyone else. Uh, step like, was Mike was Mike trying to chime in? I saw. I thought he turned his camera on. Sorry. Mike Copter had his camera on there for a while. I think. Uh, <laughs> or, or Mike will come on to wrap up the meeting. Oh, okay, so, thank you, sorry. Uh, before that happened, I wanted to, to be sure we capture any comments that, that may still be here. And, um, and it looks like, uh, Kelly, you have one? I do, thanks. Um, I'm just curious from a data perspective, um, you know, the Emerging Technologies Program has been open for groups to approach um, to discuss technology since it is not limited to being attached to a product um, application. And then um, Dolores mentioned that, you know, that's been their wish as well, right? Support um, in other regulators. So I, I guess the, my question is how often has that happened? And what has been the outcome of that? Is it a visible publication? Is it, um, or has, has no one sort of accepted the, the challenge of, of bringing a, you know, a, an industry group bringing a technology before the ETP? Uh, Adam or, or Tom, can, can you respond to that? I can respond to that a little bit. Um... Uh, I think like just to Adam's uh, point of perspective, we do have um, the group come in to talk about certain tests as a more like a consortium basis, right? I mean, the, the, the problem I can see is that it's not about like whether we have a forum, we already have a forum for people to come in to talk with us as a group. But if the company among yourself, uh, is among the companies, they need to establish confidentiality agreement. How would they like to share, right? Would they be able? So this is also touch upon, upon like Adam's comments, right? I think they come, like you guys, I think that needs to be more collaboration within the industry to be able to share the information together. Because I can see the advantage is that let's say, microbial testing, right? You guys, each company can have their own data and then put it in the like more like a comprehensive data set and then to show it to us. So I think this, uh, we already see some of the example uh, based on our previous experience. So I just want to share, but the problem of this, like, like Adam say, when like people, a uh, certain group are doing it, but, but they don't really tell other people. So, but for us, it's a little bit difficult sometimes because of a certain uh, confidentiality, uh, uh, confidential uh, information there. So I just stopped here. And thank you, Larry, that, that, that helps the clarification. Uh, Jim, uh, Cyril, you are in the queue. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, I just want to say real quick that uh, be nice to get uh, C. Burr just as engaged uh, and, and get alignment between C. Burr, C. Burr and the rest of us and the hundred other countries as well. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, in one of the earlier FDA presentations, there was an indication that there is communication between the, the, the two groups and, and sharing of ETT-like activities. Um, uh, so that is that is uh, already happening. Well, I think uh, if we have no we have further, act sorry. Uh, we have one more raised hand um, from Rob. Uh, hi, sorry about that. I I I uh, I, I blew your transition. <laughs> um, just just one other quick comment about sort of the change in the in the and sort of the 
you know, the value proposition, the business case, whatever you want to call it. So I think there's actually some lessons that we can think about from um, a lot of movements in a lot of other places. And, you know, if you're familiar with sort of Daniel Kahneman's work on change and, um, and, 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 and the work of like thinking about it from, you know, an economics perspective, you know, the thing he talks about is that the, you know, the, for a, a movement to happen and a change to happen, from the current state to the compelling destination. And I think, I think the articulation of the compelling destination is really important because it has to become compelling, right? And if you think about all the stakeholders in that, really thinking about how do they fit into that compelling destination and then how do we sort of get them there, right? And the, it's, it's well studied that it's a two, for people to wanna move to that compelling destination, that has to be two to three times better than where they are now. So, so really starting to take a step back and thinking about that and how, how is this two to three times better for me, advanced manufacturing or, you know, however we want to sort of um, think about modernizing, um, you know, sort of the means of production of medicine, right? Like for, for me, I think there's, there's a discussion there, right? Painting that compelling destination and then understanding all the stakeholders and saying, where are, where are they now and how are we going to get them there? And, and, and the, there's, a, there's sort of the driving force, but then there's the kinetics, right? <laughs> Which is kind of to the point made about the strategic plan. So I just wanna make that comment because I don't think it's just about dollars and cents and quality. I think there's a lot of measures that matter, right? It's sustainability, it's the social purpose, it's all of those things. And those, those drivers are gonna be different depending on who you talk to. And if you have the holistic picture, then you can start to sort of like have the right conversation at the right time. So I just want to make that comment. And it's just something I've kind of observed kind of, you know, coming from the chemical industry and kind of coming into, you know, pharmaceuticals many years ago, but can start to see how different drivers affect how, what you're trying to do, especially in the innovation space. So um, just wanted to make that quick comment. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, so John, uh, you're going to be officially the last comment. So please go ahead. Okay, what an honor, thank you. Uh, so Rob got me, me thinking, talking about, you know, if you need to have the, the, the next step, step be two to three times better, do we want incremental change or do we want transformative change? I, I think sometimes incremental change is easier if we make this just a little bit better, you know, there's, there's less risk. But to your point, you know, maybe we should think about the transformative change and the transformative change usually means changing a lot of things at the same time to get to that next uh, vision. So, you know, I'll just, just leave us with that. And maybe that's a, a, a longer discussion to, to be had, but if we had that great grandiose vision, there's, there's a lot of risk there too. And, and how do we manage that? Very definitely. Uh, thank you very much for, for that comment. It's actually a very nice comment with which to end because for sure uh, this community is not just happy with incremental change. We really want more substantive change. Um, we're hit the official 12 o'clock time. And so the appropriate um, speaker now is Mike Kopcha, who's the effectively the sponsor for this workshop. And, and Mike, you get the, the, the last word. I get the final word. Thanks, Rex. Um, couple things I, I did want to point out because I did have a couple of comments I wanted to make uh, in terms of the uh, questions uh, and the comments that came uh, uh, you know, during this last panel discussion. Um, first of all, I, I do want to point out that both CDER and CBER, um, as you correctly highlighted, Rex, um, are indeed working together around advanced technology uh, or advanced manufacturing, you know, whichever way you want to define it. Um, we've put together what we call the Center uh, for Advancement of Manufacturing Pharmaceuticals and Biopharmaceuticals. So we are engaging with our partners in CBER to be able to do that. Um, so, um, you know, I, I just kind of wanted to highlight that piece. The other piece, um, two other things I just wanted to mention uh, that came up during the discussion. One, you know, when companies come in and talk to us uh, about advanced technology, typically, although not always, uh, they do come in with a specific um, uh, uh, application type in mind. Um, so, you know, those are company confidential type discussions. So we are limited um, or, or, you know, totally limited uh, to the fact that we cannot share that information with the public in general. 
Um, so, you know, we need to be uh, cognizant of that. Also, the other point I wanted to um, uh, highlight is that uh, a number of folks have mentioned to me and the emerging technology programs that they are afraid to come in and talk with us because, you know, to, to a point that was made earlier, some may uh, think that if they say something incorrectly, um, you know, we're, we're not going to like it. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the, um, uh, the you know, discussion will end there and we won't want to continue that, that, that talk. Um, well, I can tell you, being the person that heads up the, the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality and the Emerging Technology Program being an integral part of that office, um, you know, we, we, you know, we, we want to have these open discussions. We don't expect people to have answers. We just want to have a dialogue to be able to really start engaging. So I do, do encourage um, uh, companies or individuals within those companies to come and talk to us. Don't be afraid. You know, if you say something wrong, you know, that's, that's fine. You know, that's why we're having those discussions. You know, none of us are perfect. Um, and I'm a perfect example of that. Uh, but we do need to encourage those discussions so that we can hear from folks. Um, also, if there are individual companies that are afraid to come in and talk with us, what I would suggest is that maybe a group of companies get together, uh, talk about, you know, that, that have a common interest in this technology, and then come present that to the Emerging Technology Program or submit it to that program. And then they could uh, 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 request a meeting with the team itself. Uh, this way, there may be um, a little more comfort in doing that. So, you know, we're open and we're flexible in terms of how we could interact uh, with the industry. So with that being said, I kind of want to just then give the, the closing remarks. Um, so I do appreciate the indulgence because I did just want to make a couple of those points um, as part of my closing remarks. Um, as I had mentioned yesterday, uh, the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality um, held our biennial uh, uh, pharmaceutical quality symposium earlier this week. So we have it once every two years. One comment from that event really struck me, and this comment came from somebody in the industry working with our emerging technology program to implement uh, manufacturing innovations. And what they said is that the FDA is a barrier to implementing new technologies. And, and this, you know, they, I'm, I'm not exactly quoting, but I'm kind of paraphrasing here. And they said that is because the FDA should uh, be a barrier to implementing new technologies. Now that sounds kind of odd, um, but the reason why they said that is that we, the FDA, are first and foremost a consumer protection agency, uh, if you will. So it's our job to ensure that only safe, effective quality medicines then are available to patients and consumers. So I do want to put it in that context, um, you know, how we're defining barrier, um, because it is our jobs, you know, again, to protect the, the um, uh, American public. So when it comes right down to it, the most important thing is not how or where the medicine is made. It is that US patients and consumers benefit from the availability of those medicines. I know there was some discussion uh, during this panel discussion or during this, this open discussion, uh, uh, which preceded my closing remarks. Um, though we are not, and we don't consider ourselves to be a barrier, part of assuring that quality medicines are available is making sure that there aren't also unnecessary regulation or regulatory barriers to implementing promising technologies. Because we wanna to start to minimize our oversight, but the way to minimize that oversight uh, by us is to make sure that we're at a quality level or a quality management maturity level that, uh, that allows us the ability then to maybe inspect companies less and to back off from doing those inspections as frequently as we may need to. Um, so that is one of the incentives that we do try to stress uh, often when we have these discussions about incentivizing people to look at um, advanced manufacturing, um, but not only advanced, uh, advanced manufacturing technologies, but just to enhance their quality systems and, and enhance the quality approach that they have within their own companies. So uh, however, um, at the FDA, we are, we are not always in the best position to know what promising technologies are coming, or for that matter, to anticipate all of the regulatory hurdles that we might face. So this is a new area for us, hence the reason why we want to have these discussions, hence the reason why we're here um, over the last two days uh, with this NASM facilitated discussion, because we really do have to hear from, from all of you. So this provides that opportunity. Uh, we can't do it on our own, and this is why I appreciate your help, the reason why we're having these discussions, not only in this workshop, but in a series of workshop, uh, workshops and events that uh, have led us to this point, because we've had similar discussions like this in other fora. So I value the um, uh, spread of knowledge and experience that this uh, audience has, 
and the committee has brought to this important topic. So I really do appreciate that from each and every one of you, as well as from the uh, 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 NASM itself. Uh, one very significant thing to keep in mind as we draw to a close is not only the mission of the FDA, because we talked about, um, um, I'm not sure, uh, there was an individual that kind of presented some of the mission statements of not only the FDA, but also of, uh, of other companies. Um, what I really want to also mention is that this is just not the mission of the FDA. You know, we need to protect the, uh, uh, the, the, the public. We really do need to bring up the level of quality. And this should not only be the mission of the FDA, but should be the mission of all of us and even uh, uh, some of us that are not here today that participate in this discussion. So that is to say we do not develop or we, we, the FDA do not develop or manufacture drugs. We only regulate those that do. So I just want folks to keep that in mind. So we don't always have the requisite experience um, or, or background or understanding uh, or technical acumen that, that we may need. So that's the reason why we need to engage in discussions like this. Um, I thought it was also telling in the polls that were showed earlier today um, and that were conducted yesterday that the audience thought changes in regulatory practices could accelerate innovation to some extent, while changes in industry practices would enable uh, innovation to a large extent. I think what this shows is that like it or not, we're in this together. Um, and you know, we're gonna have to depend upon one another and deliver on our respective missions. Um, so again, you know, we keep stressing about interacting with each other, talking about uh, you know, these issues with each other. So please, I ask you, you know, to, to have no trepidation when you wanna talk about this, again, especially through the uh, uh, Emerging Technology Program, that is part of my office and that is my commitment to make sure that we have these open and, and honest dialogues uh, with you. Um, and, and you know, we're not gonna hold anything against you. Um, so in closing, I would just wanna take the opportunity to, to thank NASM for putting this together both the committee as well as the technical org organizers of this. These, these workshops are never easy to put together and facilitate, especially when it's 100% remote or virtual. So I thank each and every one of you for being here and with us virtually over the last two days. And hopefully we'll have more opportunities um, and I'm looking forward to those opportunities to engage on manufacturing uh, innovation as well, You know, because this is a topic that we are all clearly passionate about. You can see how people um, really want to share their thoughts and ideas around this. So what I would ask is now let's take what we've learned and use manufacturing innovation to give patients and consumers more confidence and better quality in their next uh, dose of medicine that they take. So I will leave it at that. And again, thank you for the privilege of your time over the last day and a half. Rex, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you for those, uh, you know, very positive comments and and, and the openness to communication at all levels and in all manners of aggregation. Um, we certainly encourage the community to follow up on it. Uh, for my part, I, I do wanna thank the, the speakers uh, who've contributed uh, really to, to make this a successful meeting. And, and of course, all of the comments and questions there and responses to polls that the community at large uh, provided to us. Um, as uh, Linda indicated earlier, the uh, uh, recording of, of these sessions will be released on the uh, uh, NASM website uh, relatively shortly. There is also uh, in the queue a, a, um, a report in brief, a written report in brief that will be issued. Um, I'm not sure what the timing is of that. Do you know, Linda? Um, the, so the proceedings in brief, it goes through a review process, and so we would be expecting a published report sometime in the spring. Okay. Um, so um, NASM follows its, its normal review processes, which, um, you know, takes some time. But um, in the meantime, you certainly have, will have access to the recordings. So thank you, everyone, for contributing to a really valuable session. Uh, we hope uh, we have the opportunity to engage in various ways in the future. Thank you.